speaker is Basu, is a registered valuer, IBBI independent director, fellow of the ICA of India with a specialization in financial strategy from the Open University Business School, UK. She had more than three decades of experience in accounting, management, consultancy, and training, having held various positions in corporate houses, consulting firms, and education institutions. Over to you, ma'am. I'm sure the, all the budding entrepreneurs are waiting to hear from you. Ma'am, are you there? Post later. Yeah, what a course to tell. Keto Ki Basu is not in this meeting and the Indian thoughts there. Not in the meeting. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. yeah, I think I got uh, my internet drop me out. Okay, okay. no problem. Yeah. Please continue, ma'am. Yeah, just a moment. Yeah. So, good morning, everybody, and happy to be here today. Thank you, FKCCI, for inviting me to this session. So, today we'll quickly, uh, in the short time span that we have, I'll be taking you through what we call as financial projections and how you should do it. And at any point, if you have questions or we can take the questions at the end, I hope someone is coordinating the questions at the end, we can take it. Okay, so um, when we talk about uh, financial projections, it is nothing but we are talking about the same profit and loss, but... Uh, We'll break it up into the various components of the profit, profit and loss to understand it better. So um, the first part, when we talk about revenue, revenue is not only sales, what we commonly know as, but what we sell in the business in terms of goods or services, which is the core business, forms the operating revenue. But we may have extra money which we may invest for higher returns and uh, such things are basically treated like for instance if you put it uh, in a deposit you get what is called interest if you buy shares you get what is called dividend so such income not being part of the core business of uh, goods and services that you sell forms part of non-operating income. Now, uh, when we talk about the revenue, here we are talking about the operating revenue. Now, uh, depending on your type of business, the type of or the source of revenue could be different. So I just uh, explain this a little bit. Now, um, one is you, if you're just dealing in products, like in goods, you're selling goods, 
then each of these is basically a transaction. It's a transaction. Each time you sell an item, you um, get uh, something out of it. It's a transaction that happens and you get, uh, it's a sale. And uh, that revenue, the sale of goods is basically priced on the basis of the product that you sell, the goods that you sell. But for instance, if you are dealing in a service, a service could be an example of a service, could be a consultancy service, where you don't really have a product to sell, but it is based on the time you invest to deliver your knowledge or you help someone. So at that time, you need to price your revenue based on the time spent. The third type is a recurring revenue. An example of a recurring revenue is when perhaps you deal with a software product which has, um, say, a subscription model. For instance, you could be selling a, a license or software license, which is renewable at the end of every year. So every year or at the period or, say, six months, two years, whatever is your renewal, you get a subscription. So that subscription is like a revenue that irrespective of the new customers, the existing customers that decide to continue with you will continue to pay you. That is like a recurring revenue which reoccurs every time. And the fourth type could be a project-based revenue where you've been given a specific uh, job to do for some organization or you have for instance, your product is such that you render a service for a piece of work that you do for a company. In that case, it could be a mixture of goods and services. And so the pricing would be based on both time as well as material. And it's like a project-based revenue. So when we talk about projections, we are basically trying to understand what our future revenue, future expenses would look like, which you're trying to do now and which is something that you need to submit when you submit your projections to for this competition. So um, why do we need to do projections and who looks at the projection? The one is, from a business perspective, like I presume at this stage, all of you know what is a shareholder. So the shareholders being the owners of the company want to understand from the projections, the financial projections, as to where the company would head in say about three years, five years, whatever time frame you put to understand what is the near and future horizon of the company and how does it look like in from the business perspective? Now, with that, the management, the management are the people who are running the business. They also need to understand this aspect because only with this aspect will the shareholders and the management be able to take a decision on future uh, goals of the company, the vision, the mission of the company, where the company wants to go. And there are a lot of corrective actions that may take place during this period. The other kind of people who are interested in financial projections are the investors and the lenders. Now, who are these investors and who are lenders? Investors are people who are giving you money to help the organization grow. They are basically the equity shareholders. And they are not looking at their money being returned, but they are looking at the money that they put in grows over a period of time. And after it grows, they may sell their stake and they may move out. That is how they make money, like a long-term plan. Whereas lenders are typically people from whom you borrow money, like a bank, a financial institution, who would lend you money 
with the intention that you give them an interest, which is a regular return every at a particular period of interval, plus at the end of a period, they want to see that their entire money that they gave you is also returned back to them. So that's why they're called lenders from whom you borrow money. Now, the third aspect which is looked into while doing financial projections is that you also understand, as I said, both the shareholders, the management, where the strengths and weaknesses of the organization are and how they should define the path forward, how the organization should grow, should not grow, whether it's a viable project at all, whether it makes sense to run this business, whether the current product or the service that has been selected makes sense in the long run, or should it be pivoted to something different? Should the organization look at some other avenues from which it can earn more money? This is what you get from the strengths and weaknesses. And also, you understand what are the hurdles ahead? What are the problems that the organization can face? And how to tackle these problems going forward? Okay, so before I get into revenue, uh, how to project up to this stage, does anybody have any questions? Is there somebody from FKCCI who would be um, coordinating these questions, the question part of it? Is someone there from FKCCI? Does any, anybody have any question? Okay. So now I'll just take a case. This case is you are a health drink manufacturer and uh, you are um, you have found a new formula. And this formula is basically going to help to cure diabetes. And it's already clinically approved. So now you want to see what money you're going to make out of this particular health drink. You're trying to find that out. So how do you go about with it? So in the first year, you realize that there are two sources of operating revenue. See, we don't get into the non-operating revenue projections, which is more or less a figure which you'll have to estimate based on how much cash or money surplus you have, which goes into the business. But looking at the operating revenue in case of a drink manufacturer, so this company decides that it will have two sources of this operating revenue. One is the outright sale of the health drinks. The other is a semi-finished product, which is in the form of a concentrate or a syrup, which it sells as a white label to another health drink manufacturer or a bottling partner, who will then enhance this, bottle it, and sell. So it will probably go in a different brand name as against your finished product of the drink. So what you estimate that in future, uh, you will be able to, in the first year, sell about 100,000 units of the finished drink. And the con concentrate, you expect it to be about 50% of the total drink, like the bottle drink, your direct sales. And so since the semi-finished one is not a complete product and there are a lot of costs that have not gone into it, you decide to price it at 30 rupees and the other one at 50 rupees a unit. Now by unit, this unit, I've deliberately taken it as a unit because when you tailor this to your own business, this unit could be anything else. For instance, in case of drinks, I could call this unit a bottle. I could call the unit in terms of milliliters. I can call it in terms of liters. That is something to be defined. 
But for simplicity, I just take it as units. And so from the sale of drinks, you expect a income of about 50 lakhs in year one. And um, from the concentrates, about another 15, which makes a total operating revenue in the first year of a 65 lakhs. In the second year, you expect volumes to go up in terms of drinks by about 20%. And in terms of concentrates, you expect it to go up by another 30%. So with that, you don't estimate the price per unit because you're just new in the market with this particular health drink. So you decide to keep the price per unit stagnant, but your volume increases by 20%. So 20% of one lakh unit becomes a lakh and 20. And 30% of the 50,000 becomes 65,000. With that, you expect your total sales to become 79 lakhs 50,000 in year two. In year three, when you get to year three, now you decide that, okay, now my slowly my volumes are going to start stabilizing. I am going to increase my direct sales of complete drinks, but I'll start slowly reducing selling the um, sorry selling the concentrate. So with the concentrate, you expect uh, that to become reduced to about fifteen percent. But you increase the per unit value to about from 50 to 55 per unit and the concentrates from 30 to uh, 35 per unit, which results in a crore plus of revenue in year three. Now, in so this is as far as products are concerned. Now I'm getting into the aspect of services. Now by service, we mean various things. We could have here deliveries, where deliveries could be the number of deliveries, like if you consider, for instance, a Swiggy or a Zomato, who may be charging on the basis of the number of deliveries it does, where it is not dealing in the item that it delivers, it doesn't manufacture that, it just picks it up from somewhere else and it delivers that. So that delivery is basically the number of deliveries into the price per delivery is your is how you calculate your revenue. And suppose you have a subscription model, there you can look at the new subscribers or the ones that have renewed, and what is your price per subscription. So here in subscription, it consists of two parts. One is the new customers, and let's assume that both are priced the same. A renewal is priced the same as a new subscription. So let's say if your subscription is 1,000 rupees, you have existing 10 customers, you have a new, and all 10 re get renewed and you have a new 50 added in. So basically you have 60 customers, 60 subscribers, and you fix a price per subscription. Now, when it comes to royalty, royalty is also a service revenue. Royalty is when you have a know-how, you have developed something, and with that, you are allowing someone else to sell your product. Now that doesn't come free. The person who sells the product somewhere else needs to pay you a certain rate of royalty or a percentage, which is basically a percentage of their volume of sales. So that is a percentage, royalty percentage you gain. The other thing is through advertisement. Typically, if you're dealing in food delivery, you can have advertisements you allow advertisers to come in and so based on each advertisement you have a pricing fixed so um 
this is just an indication of numbers, but on the right side, it just gives you how you would be able to calculate it. And this is an indication of the revenue, how you, uh, what is a service revenue? What is a royalty revenue? Okay, I'll pause here before I get into expenses. Does anybody have any questions? You can unmute yourself and ask these questions if you do have any. If not, I will continue. If you have any questions up to this point, you can ask. You can please unmute yourself and ask. Okay. So now uh, having, yeah, someone has a chat. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, you can raise a hand. There is someone from FKCCI who is coordinating this. So if you have any questions. Okay, sir. Sure, sure, sure madam. We will we'll, we'll communicate to you, madam. Right now, as of now. Okay, fine. Okay, you can just interrupt and tell me. So sure. now we finished the income side of the projections. Now we get into the expenditure side. Now, um, yeah, someone has raised their hand. Some, somebody is asking how to calculate. Calculate what? Can you unmute yourself and tell me what is it you want calculated? Sorry, Deb. My screen was a little stuck. Yeah, can you tell me? Unmute yourself and uh, can you tell me your question, please? Yeah. Hi. Second point, you have told me that uh, number of subscription new divided by uh, renewed into price for subscription. Can you please explain again the second point now? No, sorry, uh, that doesn't mean division. It means or. Okay, okay. Where I say that either number of new subscribers or renewed subscription. So both we have to add on. Yeah, no. So yes, that's what I said. Suppose you have subscriptions of say as i said that suppose you have in year one 10 customers right let's say 10 licenses you've sold in year one okay so in the next year let's say you have 20 and all the 10 from year one renew then your total number of subscribers becomes 30. does that make sense Yes, ma'am. Got it. Got it? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So now we get into the projections. Yeah. So now you please uh, note this. Like suppose you have raw materials. That is, you will have raw materials when you're dealing in a product. And if you have raw materials... Usually, the raw material price will be a certain percentage of your sales. And why so? Because, for instance, if I am, um, for instance, if I'm making, let's say, a smartphone. Now, in the smartphone, I have many raw materials that go into creating a smartphone. But I know that for one smartphone, I require so many of this X item. Y item and Z item to create the finished product. So let's say I require 10 of X, 5 of Y, and 20 of Z. I will definitely need that many times as long as I increase my product. Now, suppose I'm making one smartphone, I need 10, 5, 20. Moment I increase that to two phones, it becomes 2, 10, 40 because it doubles. So same way if I make 100, the number of raw materials increase in that proportion. 
there yeah. will be some wastage, but over a period of time, you will know how much is the acceptable waste where certain things break or cannot be used in the process. So therefore, this 50% which is there in the last column is basically a percentage of the revenue. The revenue also has a profit element in it, but it is going to be a percentage of the amount I sell is going to be my raw material cost always in production. When I have a product to, when I'm producing something. The next thing is salaries. Salaries is in the first year, you will have to estimate this based on who you need to run the business. Now, you will remember one thing. Then in year one, the business is just starting and is slowly going to pick up. So you don't want to hire everybody who you require finally from day one because they may not have a job to play. So as and when there is some role for a person, you will hire. So someone may be hired for six months. Someone may be required from the first year for all 12 months. Someone may be required in the last two months of the first year. So you will actually have to break this down into the kind of people you will need at the various times during the year one and then estimate how much you would have to pay them to make them work for you. And based on that, you will get a certain figure. So let's say we calculated for year one that the salary figure came to 12 lakhs. Now, salary is not connected to sales unless it's a sales commission. Salary will be a fixed amount, more or less fixed. And internally within the organization, you will have to decide what is the annual increase in pay you plan to give. So in this case, I've assumed a 15%. So from year two and three, you extrapolate that figure and you multiply it by the escalation figure. The next thing is, other things that can come in is the rent of the premises or hire of equipment, which you will have to estimate and find out how much it would cost. And same way, you will have to assume a percentage of increase year on year. See, remember when you're doing a financial projection, it will not be 100% equal to what is going to be the reality later on. It is something that you put down based on the market information based on your environment that you know currently and what you expect to happen. But as we said earlier, we do these projections so that you can go on changing it as you go along, understanding your business better. Same way you estimate what is the particular cost of, sorry, cost of electricity and uh, water expenses for the premises that you take on hire. And what would you budget for marketing, advertising and marketing? Today you have various sources in which you can do cheaper marketing. So you may not want to spend even 13 lakhs in year one. You may put it at a much lower figure, but again, you need to do a research on this. There are today web marketing that you can do and there are a lot of um, social media channels through which your, if your product can be pro uh, promoted, you can look at social media platforms through which it can be promoted. But there, how much that is cost for a business advertisement to be given? And how much are you willing to spend on that? This is what you need to estimate. And can you, with your increase in sales, or do you expect that if you had more money and if you did a little more of a campaigning, your, your volumes of sales are likely to go up. So here I've assumed a 15% increase, but advertising marketing actually is a cost that varies depending on the kind of business. Sometimes organizations invest a lot on advertising marketing in the initial couple of years. And as volumes start picking up, as there is a visibility in the market, 
they slowly start reducing the budget on this. So you can look at it. Whatever you do, you need to justify why and what you what is your rationale behind advertising costs. Now, transport and distribution could come in. Like in this case, we've taken a case of a health drink. Now, if you have a transport and distribution, you may be selling it through a retailer, through a dealer. So there you have some kind of a cost associated with it, which is again, assume that it will not go up high, but it will increase about 2% year on year. See, these percentages are just an indicator percentage. You will need to put in your percentage based on your product, your service, your understanding of how you feel such costs are likely to go up in future. The professional fees are fees that you would probably have to pay to anybody for some expert knowledge. For instance, you may you may, need, may not want to keep a full-time accountant in the beginning. You may not want to keep a full-time admin person in the beginning. Or you may just keep an admin person at a lower rate and you may outsource your entire compliances in terms of income tax, GST, then all kinds of statutory compliances. You may give it to a professional to handle it. And so you estimate that this is the amount you may require for professional fees. And other expenses is very uh, is basically miscellaneous expenses, which is not included in any of the line items above. Now, this is just an indicative list of expenses. In your business, you could have many more expenses. You could have much less than this also, depending on your type of business. With this, you estimate that in year one, you are likely to have a loss, which is fine. You don't have to push to show a profit in year one, because in year one, you're basically setting up your business, you're understanding the market, you're seeing what is around you. So it does take time to build that market. So therefore, in the first year, uh, it's absolutely acceptable to have a loss in the first year. The second year, you make a minimal profit. And third year, you're able to make a good profit. Is there a question? You want the Q&S session by time? Yes. Okay, I will try to do that. Yeah, I'll try. Let me see. Okay, then the uh, next thing is... Okay, so now the next thing is the fund management. The fund management means that why do we need money? And if you know what is credit period and the sources of funds. So what is the need for funds is you need the funds to run the business, to buy your raw materials, to pay your people till you start earning. Credit period is the time that you get that is... Um, for instance, today, uh, your supplier may allow you a credit period to not pay him upfront when you take the materials, but to drag it a little beyond a period to give you a time, say 30 days, 15 days by which you can pay him. And similarly, a credit period may be asked for by your customers saying that I don't pay you upfront, but I pay you after some time. Source of funds, I think we discussed a little earlier, which is either the equity investors or you get um, a lender to uh, lend you. You can, and, or in case of lending, you can have what is called a long-term lending or a short-term lending. Now, short-term funding is the funding or the working capital cycle that happens within any organization. So what do you need the money for? for purchase of your raw materials, processing of the raw materials to make it into a finished product. Then basically, then only you will have to be able to sell and deliver and bill to the customer who is your debtor. And then only the debtor will pay you. So this is the entire period till from, you start from one till you get to five, you shouldn't have enough money for this period. 
But just let's, uh, before we wind up, just let's look at three kind of situations how this works. Now, let's say your entire production cycle or your time to produce this health drink takes about 10 days. And it ten, takes you another seven days for the final product to reach the customer and to bill it and sell it to a customer, which includes finding a customer and selling it. So basically, that means from a 10 plus a 7 days, 17 days of money you should have with you, assuming in situation one, that the customer is paying you cash across the counter and collecting your health drink. If such a thing happens, you need money only for 17 days. Let's come to a situation where your vendor wants the money to be paid immediately. Like in the previous case also, your vendor has not given you extra time to pay. So you have 10 days in which you need your raw material will be converted into your finished product. Another seven days to sell. And the customer will says that he will pay after only 30 days. He needs 30 days for payment. In which case, your 17 days of funds needed now becomes 47 days. Because you need another 30 days of money. Because you don't stop your cycle. Your business doesn't or your factory doesn't stop functioning when you've sold a drink. Because immediately when you're selling, there is another batch that has come up simultaneously. So there's constantly one which is getting processed and another new product which is again coming in, new materials coming in. So there's a co continuous flow of production that's happening. So you, at a time, you need to have 47 days of money if your customer is going to pay you only after 30 days. Now let's come to the third situation where your customer wants it after 30 days, fine. But your vendor from whom you buy the raw material has given you 30 days time to pay. So what is happening here is you've bought the raw materials. Basically, you haven't paid for the raw materials. 10 days you use it for manufacturing. Seven days to sell to the customer. When 17 days have gone by, you still have 13 more days in which you can pay the customer, the vendor. So that is what you still have 13 days. So basically, you don't need to have extra money to run your business. But in such cases, this fuel system or this entire process, you should ensure that it is running smoothly and there is no stagnation at any point. It doesn't stop at any point where in the cycle you don't have money, but it should be continuously moving so that at the end of sale and when you collected it from your customer, you are able to pay your vendor. I think that's about it. So if you have questions, we can take the questions now. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I think it was a very detailed and focused presentation. I would request the students uh, to yes. ask questions in case you have any questions. Please type in or please raise your hand and unmute, unmute yourself. Ma'am, is my voice audible? Yes, yes, very much. Students, is there any questions?
Okay. There's a question from uh, somebody here. Correct. What should be the growth rate of the device? Yeah. Yeah, you can just repeat the question. Yeah. Ma'am, what should be the growth rate um, for a medical device which also sells a software along the subscription? Okay, so here what you'll have to do is you'll have to, first of all, divide the uh, component if possible, the product and the software separately. Now, to understand the growth rate of your medical device, here is where you need to go into doing a secondary research on the type of device that you're selling. You should look at the industry, what the rate at which the industry is growing, and for a new player, it will take you some time. You cannot reach anything near the industry growth rate. You will have to assume something way below the industry growth rate in the initial years. But make sure that your growth rate is much less than what the industry average is. Because initially, you can slowly pick it up in your projections, maybe in the third year or the fifth year. But initially, it will be much less because it is a time when you're trying to capture the market. See, the best way to go about this is that you first decide which are the areas or the geographies in which you're going to sell, which is the part in who are your customers. So you decide your customers. Then you look at how many customers you can acquire in the second year and third year. Go by that and then you'll automatically be able to um, calculate your growth rate based on that. Because typically, these are the questions that come. It is a non-existing product sold to hospitals. So is it, uh, you can unmute yourself also. So basically, you're talking about that you are the first player, right? You're the first player in the market and there is no competitor. Are you saying that? Yeah, you can unmute yourself, Amar. Are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. Audible? A little louder, please. Uh, is it audible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Now you are audible. Uh, ma'am, yeah. actually, it is a uh, glucose, uh, the IV bottle monitoring system, like remotely at the nurses can monitor the IV bottle, like uh, is it getting over or not, and replace. The notifications will be sent through the software for the uh, nurses or the caretakers so basically it is going to be installed in some premises within the hospital huh, and yes. they don't need to be physically present with the patient to monitor it yeah sure uh, I, yeah exactly. so now what the way you'll have to estimate this is that first of all you'll have to give a demonstration of this product when you create your product you'll have to first create a prototype you have to go and take this product show it to the hospitals and see again hospitals means you won't be able to penetrate to the bigger ones you'll have to start with the smaller nursing homes so you have to list that down to see how many you can uh, approach so suppose you approach say 50 hospitals maybe you get 10 you have to assume these things that what are, do you have inside connections is there a possibility that if you approach them, they're going to take it? Is there a possibility you can sell in tier two, tier three cities before you come to a larger city? These are things you'll have to look at. And suppose uh, that is one thing. Then you look at um, that penetration. And then you assume that, okay, first year I'm able to get 10 hospitals and sell maybe five devices in each of them. Next year, I can go to another city or another area in the same city and maybe target another 20 more. This is how you'd have to estimate. That is how your initial years, your growth rate will come. See, even if you're a new player in the market, people will have to test your product to see how beneficial it is, how useful it is before they buy it. They'll have to look at the price point. There are many things that comes into play. Am I able to answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Anybody else? Any other question? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Aditya has, uh, which part would be best 
sell the product and give subscription for the product or give the product as rental and provide sub subscription for the product. See, when you give it out on rent, it is like a subscription only. Subscription model means you're getting money from the customer. So if you're giving it out on rent, you own the vehicle, own the product still. You're giving it out to someone else. And okay, I get your point. Your rent is that the equipment or whatever you're giving is owned by you. And you give it to the customer who pays your rent. The, th the other subscription is when is like a software. You give the product and the enjoyment or the benefit of the product is only available for a short period of time after which they have to pay more to be able to use it. Am I right? Can you unmute yourself and Aditya, can we hear you? Aditya, can you unmute yourself? Aditya? Are they able to unmute themselves? No, madam. We are giving facility. Facility meaning? I'm, Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm asking. We are giving unmute. access. Access. I'm, I'm okay. access here, but he is not able to. Okay. Fine. So, uh, okay. So, Aditya, if you, uh, if I've understood correctly, so these are the two different things. Now, let me tell you the pros and cons of both of them. Now, if you um, give it out on rent, you still own the product. Now, um, you have to remember one thing that when you own the product, is the customer going to treat the product the way you would have liked it to be treated? If not, the product is going to slowly start deteriorating, getting spoiled. So when you give it out on rent, you have to make sure your costing is done properly such that or the contract has a clause whereby if there is a damage to the product, you can take it back. Or you can, when you take it back, you still gain something out of it. You haven't lost the product completely. So that is some cost you have to build in when you are renting it out. In a subscription, that problem doesn't arise. You price it very low. A subscription could be like you're selling a software app which has got the very basic features and you price it very, very low in the first year. Second year, you can enhance it. You can give something more. You can give them some loyalty and then they continue to stay with you. You have no liability as far as the product is concerned. That's the difference. So you have to weigh the two, see what are your costs associated with running the two models. In rent, I told you that there are a lot of risks when you have a rental model. Yes, Rishabh, can you unmute yourself? Aditya, why else I able to answer your question? We can go on to the next person then, Rishabh. Yes, uh, yes ma'am. Am yes. I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, you are. Yeah, ma'am, uh, I have the same question as uh, Mr. Aman Chandra did. Yeah, ma'am, uh, but okay. uh, the only difference is... Uh, the the uh, product is uh, present in the market, but it is totally imported. And okay. we are the first ones to uh, produce here uh, it in India. So yeah, uh, we just wanted to know how to uh, penetrate in the market, Mami. See, this penetration is again the marketing thing. See, it is when you're coming into the market, uh, when there you have a competitor outside India, then maybe uh, is yours also for the hospital sector, healthcare? No, ma'am. Uh, it is in the polymer sector, ma'am. We have basically prepared a resin for a three D printing in the liquid form. Okay. So here, what you will have to, when you create your prototype and you go out to your prospective customers, you here okay. your demonstration will be a little different, where you will have to make the customer aware. See, there will be two categories of customers. There'll be one category of customer who doesn't even know that the imported item exists and what benefits it gives. There will be one who knows that the imported item exists, 
and it's too expensive. The price point is very different. So you could probably start the market penetration by approaching those who already know about the product. If they already know about the product and they know the price, can you demonstrate the same or more benefits which the imported product has and demonstrate the price point being so much lower? That is how you will have to penetrate the market. But again, you will have to do a homework on who's you're going to be your customer going forward. And then you have to mark, uh, create a plan as to how you're going to use this marketing strategy to reach out to them as you go along. Does it make sense? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Next. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Anybody else? Ma'am, um, since we are running out of time, I would request uh, students to uh, please mail your questions. We, it will be uh, delivered to the speaker uh, through email. We will also share the email ID at the end. Yeah. Ma'am, I really oh. had a detailed uh, presentation. I'm sure all the students uh, have benefit benefited because financial planning is one of the very you know uh, major criteria when it comes uh, to their final business plan uh, presentation. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you to FKCCI for inviting me. Thank you, students, for a patient hearing. See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I'm sure students have uh, uh, taken all the points uh, in terms of financial planning. Let us move on. Um, uh, we are very excited to um, you know, introduce Dr. Ravi Shankar, who is the founder of Gram Patishala. He is a leader in IR 4.0 technologies and its application to solve business problems, especially in the pharma sector. He crafts learning journeys and delivers AI ML courses for CXOs in the healthcare, banking, and retail verticals. Dr. Ravi Shankar is also an entrepreneur, mentor, and investor in the ag food techs and rural impact startup ecosystem. Currently a visiting professor and leading business institutes in India and abroad. Ravi sir specialization in teaching AI and business adoption, computer vision, and deep learning. He also consults and drives data science driven digital transformation initiatives as at Fortune 1000 firms. Welcome, sir. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you for the um, introduction and kind words. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, the Manthan team uh, for organizing and putting this together. And also, I'd like to thank uh, FKCCI and all the participants uh, with this, uh, without further ado, we get started. The topic, uh, I was given a free hand to choose uh, whatever topic I thought was relevant. Um, I chose uh, minimum viable product as a topic uh, because it's very fascinating, interesting, and very relevant as we speak. So um, the topic, therefore, is the power of uh, MVP or MVPs. Really, in today's uh, uncertain, fast-paced world, uh, the concept of uh, MVP has kind of revolutionized um, how quickly you can take ideas to market and also how effectively you can solve a genuine customer problem. At the same time, it's very strategic in nature. When I say strategic, it's because uh, you can maximize learning with minimum costs and resources. Um, therefore, um, that's therein lies the power of MVP. Uh, today, we'll spend some time um, talking about um, uh, the first principles surrounding MVP, what, why, how, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So besides touching upon principles, benefits, some steps, and some to top it up in the end with some real-world examples. So, <clears throat> so Professor Einstein uh, from uh, Harvard Business School uh, kind of remarked in his uh, research article a few years back that most startups fail. Actually, if you look at some numbers, they say more than 75%, 80%. In today's day and age, uh, in the last, uh, let's say, two, three years, uh, when the, uh, you know, the uh, funding winter has set in, it's, it's, they say it's north of 90%. But again, it would vary from country to country, sector to sector, et cetera, et cetera. 
but uh, having said that, most startups fail um, because um, uh, they build the wrong product, right? So at the end of the day, uh, it's not that they, they can't build a product uh, or solution. It's just that uh, the solution is not right or the, the product is, is not, uh, there's no product market fit uh, as what we call PMF. So a lot of money resources uh, wasted literally down the drain. So that's what it is. But then uh, Professor Reinsman also propounded a, a, a methodology uh, quite uh, related to MVP called as the Lean Startup Methodology. And uh, it's, it's turned uh, uh, very powerful, uh, pragmatic, uh, literally so that many tech startups in the Bay Area, in the US have uh, embraced this uh, approach of MVP and Lean Startup and really turned around and made it to make, um, they have achieved a lot of success uh, from different matrices. Um, so well, MVP is all about, you know, uh, you know, building, iterating, uh, you know, measuring and learning and repeat. It's a cycle. Uh, these are fundamental principles, of course, we'll touch upon the, the four principles uh, in a subsequent slide. But if you know how to build with minimum resources, measure the right metrics, uh, have continuous learning early on from you know, customer feedback, and then keep iterating the process. Um, more often than not, startups and businesses will uh, be successful in their endeavors. So essentially, it is you know the ability of a business or a startup to launch the product as quickly as possible with minimal resources. Yeah. Um, therefore, it's what we call the most basic essential features of the product. We call it bare bounds product, and just enough features. No, you know, not that many, not that little, but just enough so that it will allow continuous feedback from early adopters, uh, early customers, right? So, and then one has a opportunity to continue to keep testing, refining the hypothesis, right? Continuously. That is uh, uh, the key. Uh, this is the secret sauce. If you're able to launch with MVP, uh, then nothing like it, right? So, Steve Blank is a serial entrepreneur, is adjunct faculty with multiple uh, universities, Stanford, uh, Stanford, UC Berkeley, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, he has remarked, uh, and he has quite a few startups up to Steve. He says that in an MVP, you're selling the vision, delivering the minimum features to the visionaries, not to the entire market, not to everybody, just to the people who buy into your uh, vision, right? So. Therefore, let's now dwell upon what is MVP. There are two, three slides. Um, I have deliberately chosen to reinforce this concept of what is MVP so that, you know, there's good clarity around the concept. Uh, MVP is nothing but, uh, you know, it so starts with this, a picture speaks a thousand words. It starts with an idea. It then goes to the product and data, right? So that's what it is. Um, MVP is at the very core of what um, a lean startup is, right? It's fundamental to this lean startup principle. Lean in terms of resources, lean in terms of time, in terms of money, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it is also the product or a solution with highest ROI. Remember, you will get maximum return on investment with, of course, minimum resources, uh, be it time, money. And I believe that as startups, right, um, the biggest um, shortcoming you'll, you'll face is you'll be running short of time, you'll be sh running short of resources, you'll be running short, short of money. So I think... In that con context, MVP becomes a cornerstone strategic um, lever to play around with. Yeah, It also means developing minimum amount of features that are required so that you can quickly release or launch the product or deploy the product so that you can get continuous feedback from customers. So it could be a proof of concept, it could be a prototype, or it could be the entire product itself. So uh, that's what MVP is, but logically, you start with the POC, come to the prototype, and then the MVP in that order. There are subtle differences yeah, between all three of them. Further dwelling on defining right, uh, first principles of MVP, there are four dimensions you can uh, kind of uh, define MVP, MVP from. It starts with the core concept, right? What is the fundamental core problem that you're solving. Therefore, it should allow for maximum amount of learning or validation from customers with minimum effort. So that is the core concept. Uh, the concept is not about the product or the solution itself. It's about learning 
which will come to subsequently it's it's the ability of the product to allow the founders to collect maximum amount of validated feedback on a continual basis with minimum efforts the second dimension by defining mvp is that to focus on the bare minimum the bare bones the essentials right the must have not the good to have so therefore you only focus on those essential functionality so that it will allow for effective testing of the product idea with real customers yeah this is the key not with uh, fictional customers or uh, family and friends but with real customers the third dimension is learnability it's essentially a learning tool uh, it is said that in the 21st century the most important skill that one can acquire is learning so mvp is a learning tool essentially it it helps you to gain insights harvest information and insights about the customer wants and needs and preferences therefore you can then craft a fully featured product down the line it's a iterative process uh, it it is a continuous process it's a iterative process uh, it is designed as a first step so essentially the very starting step the fundamental first step is mvp and it goes on and on it could take few months few years version 1.0 to version 3.0 4.0 it's like writing a book all right so but you need to launch quickly and you need to continuously gather feedback from customers so these are the four dimensions which will help define the concept of mvp which is very strategic and powerful hello sir so sorry to interrupt slides are not moving are you sure yeah yeah slides i'm sorry uh i'm hey, sorry you can, can make it slide show sir uh now is it moving i am in slide 2 can you see slide number 2 yeah i we can we can but entire screen uh, uh, we can able to visible but uh, slide show it's not coming no Do now have... i am on slide number 3 can you see slide number 3 yeah we can we can okay uh let me let me know if you cannot see the slides you know that seeing the slides is important now yeah. i am on slide number 4 moving on to slide number 5 oh, no yeah. it's not it's not moving not moving okay i don't know why what's the problem uh let me see uh why is it not moving yes sir yes let sir let me stop sharing and then start sharing again sometimes you know there is some Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, tech issue. Let me show the window. Uh, now I'm sharing again. Uh, now is it visible? Uh, no, visible. I'm on slide number. Five. Visible, visible. But you have to click on the slide show button, which I have done actually. Uh, done, na. But all slides are. Uh, 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 just tell me what is that you can see now currently, Nagraj. Uh, right now, actually, one, two, three, four, five. The, the, defining the minimum viable product. That that slide we can able to see, sir. Now I am on full. Now I am put it on full slide show. Can you see what is that you see now? It's a blank screen now, right? No, 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 no. Defining the minimum viable products that slide is there. No, that we can. Okay. Currently, what is that you are able to see? Defining the minimum viable product. Okay. So I think there is an issue here. Let me see. Why is that? Well, again, sir, redo this. Just one sec. So maybe I have to H tab. Let me share our entire screen. Let me see this. If that is. Uh, okay. Now are you able to see the full screen? No, right now nothing is there, sir. You didn't, you didn't share the screen as of now. Uh, now can you see the screen? No. 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 Okay. Uh, you, have to, you have to close all the screen sharing options once again. Once again, you have to share, sir. Okay. I'll just okay. Let me try that. So I go to share screen. Should I select window? Yeah, I think window is what works generally. Uh, uh, PowerPoint slideshow. Okay, let me use this. Share this. 
okay now i think you must be able to see now yeah this, this is perfect sir you can go ahead okay thank you so i just went through this four um, dimensions through which you can define the mvp just so that i'll quickly take 30 seconds and start from the beginning for okay so so that's how we started um, with the background and uh, professor einsman's concept that why startups fail we've been through this mvp is all about building measuring uh, learning and repeating the process it's very quick with minimal resources you can maximize the learnings and outcomes since you need to launch with the mvp uh, steve blank told that you should sell the vision to only a basic set of visionaries who are early customers with minimum features and we define what is mvp uh, why you get the highest roi etc etc uh, definition is done now you are able to see my animation and stepwise uh, uh, ppt right okay so moving on uh, it is strategically very critical uh, and it's of great importance it's a cornerstone strategy of any startup or any successful business startup uh, because of three or four reasons one because of resource efficiency i was mentioning earlier that a good mvp will allow you to maximize the learnings or collect the feedback with minimal resources i believe fundamentally that all all startups if not many are always starved and scarce of uh, resources be it time money people etc etc so therefore with minimal resources you get maximum learnings then there's also accelerated learning you are learning very quickly and rapidly in today's day and age uh, time is money therefore you know accelerated learning is very very critical okay it facilitates rapid learning about the customers needs and desires very quickly you can figure out what is working what doesn't work so there are two related concept here you know you fail fast learn faster the concept of failing fast was propounded by ibm in the late 2000s but um, uh, now it's the era of uh, you fail fast but learn faster that is what mvp allows you to do it's extremely extremely uh, compelling and uh, potent and thirdly market validation you want the market uh, to validate your product and solution and its features right so and that's what and you have to do it in the real market right not not just because you have a small circle who believe in your product or services but um, you have to validate your products and services what are some of the key principles of uh, uh, the mvp development there are four key principles let's uh, understand those four key principles first one is focusing on the core problem solving essentially startups or businesses are there to solve problems and problems that are genuine and real so you have to as long as you focus on the genuine core problem solving i think that's the way to start your mvp development process so when i say co solving core problems it is about identifying and prioritizing right the, that minimum set of essential features identify and then prioritize because you have limited resources nice to have can come good to have features can come later must have features have to come early to in order to identify and prioritize must have features you need to get started with the most essential features required then you sort of prioritize over perfection everybody you know has a fascination for perfection at least most of the startup founders that i know have the obsess with perfection but then perfection can become an enemy to mvp so the idea is to prioritize learning over perfection so mvp is all about learning not about getting to the best product or the perfect product or solution yeah the idea is to insight to gather those collect those insights rapidly the third principle is that of obtaining continuous customer feedback so mvp allows for a feedback loop that is very critical for validating your early thoughts and early set of assumptions therefore serving as a lighthouse to guide future iterations the final principle that is that of rapid iteration time is money you need to do lot of iterations and you need to do it fast that's what mvp allows it provides you that agility or speed and to pivot or persevere efficiently now let's look into some of the steps there are five steps yeah to to build a effective mvp what are the industry what are the product what are the solution doesn't matter these are universal principles and steps these five steps are as far as one is to research target customers now one of the biggest pain points of startups and i mentor quite a few of them 
uh, is that they are not able to define accurately and precisely who is the target customer. So defining target customers and identifying your target customers calls for research. So you have to undertake thorough market research to understand your audiences and their needs, their pain points and their preferences. Right. So the more you segment them, the more hyper segmentation possible, the better would be the chance that you'd succeed. So therefore, you have to do a lot of surveys, interviews, primary, secondary, competitive analysis. And many uh, startups do not um, have a good handle on the competitive landscapes. You know, who are the competitors? They have a very vague and fuzzy idea. But the deeper and finer insights you have into a competitive landscape through research, uh, you'd know better understand your customer, target customer. The second step is to define the core problem and features. So we have touched upon this in the last slide, but of course, you know, the problem here is in defining the core problem. The problem lies in formulating the problem or articulating the problem. Many startups, you know, they get three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes to pitch uh, in front of investors. But, you know, they struggle to clearly and crisply and succinctly articulate the problem solution in the first 60 seconds. Thereby, they lose that opportunity. So articulating the problem becomes very important. MVP allows you to articulate problem clearly because it helps you to uh, one define and identify those minimum features it helps you to figure out where target customers are identify their pain points therefore you are able to articulate better the third step is to kind of uh, clearly map the user flow and critical path what do we, what do we mean by user flow and critical path it is about again identifying the priority so you can have you, you so there's a must have and good to have the question is you need to focus on must have because you have limited resources and limited time. So prioritizing features will help ensure smoother UX UI uh, that is most essential for those basic set of functions, right? Uh, that's a primary goal that helps. Therefore, MVP framework will help you to identify that path. The fourth step is to build and release, right? To develop and launch the MVP. So uh, you have to launch to a selective group of early adopters or what we call beta testers in when it's a software as a service solution, uh, which represents your target market, right? So therefore, you have to make sure that you got a good mechanism to constantly collect user feedback and take the data and analyze the data and kind of incorporate it into your next version or next release. The final step is that of continuing to gather feedback and the process keeps repeating ad infinitum. So therefore, the idea is that you are gaining behavioral data through continuous feedback and using these insights, converting data into insights and using these insights to help you formulate and take, undertake your next few iterations, right? The iterations needs to be faster and more efficient. So cheaper, faster and better. Therefore, you're enhancing the product or service value proposition. The day. So these are the five universal steps to build an effective MVP. Of course, it's not all better process. There are some pitfalls you need to be aware of, some hurdles. Let's look at this three or four hurdles. Uh, what are the roadblocks that you may uh, encounter? The first one is there's a misunderstanding the concept itself, right? If you don't understand the concept, which is what we have spent time till now in the last four or five slides, and disproportionately larger time, and rightfully so. So what, what is there are various ways in which you know you may not get the concept right. So um, you're essentially, if you if you understand that it's all about learning, then you you not confusing the concept of MVP to that of a minimum marketable product or a lovable product. It's not about marketing. It's not about falling in love with your product or your customers. It's about learning the customer pain points. Yeah, that's what it is. And it's also second roadblock or headwinds you'll face is that are that of imbalanced focus. So balancing is an art, more of an art than a science. So what is the balance or imbalance we are talking about? The, the balance between minimum and viable. Remember, MVP has three words, minimum, viable, product. So the first two words, minimum and viable. If you are able to strike a reasonable and a fair balance between minimum and viable, I think then you would have achieved. But it's easier said than done. There's no textbookish uh, rules or norms or a playbook which will tell you how to balance. So the balance comes with the personality of the founder, the business problem you're solving, the industry that you are in, et cetera, et cetera, and the resources you have. But if you can keep it simple, right? Um, you know, 
and start small thing big these two principles keep it simple keeping it simple start small thing big that will help you achieve the balance between minimum and viable so that you can generate meaningful feedback the idea is still learning and generating meaningful feedback the third uh, problem that you will encounter is that of neglecting feedback you may be collecting feedback but if you don't collect that data and convert them into insights and then incorporate in your next version or your iteration then you are neglecting the feedback uh, many times you know you take it for granted while one thing is to continuously gather feedback feedback cannot be you know at your uh, at your beck and call or it should be continuous yeah, and you should also act the action on the feedback is very important gathering feedback is one thing actioning on it is quite another so it's all about continuously collecting the feedback and then continuously acting on the feedback as well so that you can make rapid changes the final pitfall is that of static mindset so ultimately it boils down to what is between your ears right which is cannot be taught in a classroom um, therefore i think mentorship um, becomes very critical for startup founders the mindset typically uh, human beings are wired to think uh, in a static way whereas the world is dynamic the problems are dynamic the marketplace is dynamic everything is dynamic but humans love status quo um, that's how we are we are wired uh, the more uh, agile you are in your mindset the more chances that you stand to be successful and mvp helps you to uh, to 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 change the mindset from uh, from a static to a more dynamic one so you are while you don't treat the mvp as a final product yet you should think that this is the first starting point it's it's about learning and iterating but essentially you start if you start there is there is saying that a uh, well begun is half done so mvp helps you to get there and then therefore keep changing and pivoting based on what you have learned so this is some of the things that you should uh, be aware of uh, it's not a bed of roses but i've said that with this let's move on to the real world uh, examples i am a great believer in uh, in uh, sharing real world examples because you know when an example is looked at a real one you can easily understand the concept behind uh, the intuition behind what is being you know trying to be driven home so we'll take four i have many more but let's start with um, spotify you know spotify started in a very very you know no frills plain vanilla mode they started as a simple landing page you know today you know where spotify is you know they started as a simple landing page one single web page to test streaming technologies okay that was their mvp today they are what they are because of this mvp and i will i will kind of try to articulate some more examples if there's time but i'll quickly move on to the big daddy amazon in 1995 amazon started as a simple basic online bookstore within a decade from 1995 to 2005 in 2005 they launched amazon prime they have done a lot of mvps and they have you know so they started off as a single basic online store single sku single product category today there are literally hundreds of thousands if not millions of skus on amazon you can buy a book you can buy an island you can buy everything from amazon.com and amazon.in so of course they are very focused the mvp focused approach allowed amazon to become what it is today yeah this were by dropbox also dropbox you know again they started off uh, as a video they just a demo video about file syncing functionality right and today dropbox is what it is very successful when the founders of dropbox many years ago they were pitching in front of a vc uh, they asked the vc uh, you know they asked a question to the vcs investor saying do you, any one of you use uh, file storage uh, cloud apps everybody had a blank answer so what i mean to say is that mvp as a concept if it is uh, adhered to in spirit and letter it can it can give great success yeah and then finally airbnb brian and his co-founder they just started by simply photographing and listing their own property you know and then they pivoted of course airbnb everybody knows about airbnb right so these are some real world examples there are many these are all uh, examples from us but in india if i want to give some examples it could be flipkart it could be misho it could be paytm it credo for example these are all some real uh, good uh, real world instances of companies which have kind of uh, uh you know 
embedded mvp as a dna in their uh, enterprise so to conclude you know building mvp is very strategic it is strategic because it helps you to maximize learnings with minimum resources it helps you in three things it helps you to validate your ideas gather feedback and also continuously improve or iterate towards a successful product launch or a service launch or a product launch so why it is so powerful it's powerful because it's a systemic approach it's a strategic approach it helps you to avoid common mistakes it helps you to leverage key measurement success metrics and also it can help you the the probability of success right uh, of your enterprise depends on how compelling your mvp is and therefore making sure that the market respects and make sure that you know there is greater acceptance of your products or success i have lot of other real world examples uh, many more but i'll just take a pause and see if there are questions then i can further talk about real world examples in fact not talk about but just elaborate on what i already have shared as few yeah i'll just take a pause and see if there are any questions if we are doing good on time yes sir definitely we can um, take some questions at this time uh, students in case of <coughs> questions please type in or you can raise your hand we will unmute, unmute you Hmm. So that's a question. Can MVP be simulation? Well, yeah, interesting question. <clears throat> MVP can be simulation. These are two different concepts. Uh, let me try to understand this question further. See, uh, MVP is an approach, right? Simulation is a process. Okay, so MVP can uh, you can simulate certain features using MVP approach. if i may put it that way right simply put mvp will uh, what is mvp at the uh, mvp is a very simple basic essential features of your product or solution so you can simulate it but these are two different but related aspects is what i would stop it yeah if that makes sense uh, essentially when the cost is high somebody is uh, on the chat bot i just saw in the chat box the cost is high then you are doing you are talking about prototyping and proof of concept which is again very closely related to mvp and uh, like i told you earlier in this in this in the, in the slide show uh, first it starts with the poc then we move to a prototype then you come to an mvp yes uh, it helps you to reduce cost answer is yes yeah. so it can I'll, i'm looking at the chat bo box uh, which path would be best sell product and give subscription uh, for the product give product as rental now we are talking about revenue streams right this is nothing to do with mvp but i i can take that question see at the end of the day it depends upon the founders and the investors vision that you have uh, you can see in many products and services they start as a free product and then you have a paid version so it's called as freemium as in not premium freemium so some some startups will say no we will uh, we will start pricing it from the beginning so whether you want to give it as a free product then price it or you start with the pricing itself is again a, it's it's a business strategy that the founders and the investors have to jointly uh, come towards but mvp you can do some testing of willingness to pay how much a customer is willing to pay the customer could be b2b or b2c doesn't matter but at the end of the day uh willingness to pay uh, you can you can test it out um, down that that comes into pricing analytics part but mvp is all about the features and the essential must have features of your products and services uh, how much they will pay whether you want to give it for free is a, is a, is a question of business strategy and how deep your pockets are yeah let me look at subscription for software yeah software could be you know subscription based it could be you know there's so many uh, pricing models and uh, it's a business strategy question mvp can allow you to test your product quickly 
uh, so that you can then think about pricing subsequently or you can think about pricing concurrently also uh, in not in a sequential manner that becomes again a question of business strategy and how much money you have funds you have who is your target or audience etc etc somebody is asking for access somebody wants to speak and they saying we are unable to unmute i don't know who is that um, i would request the students to raise your hand in case you want to speak we will unmute you yeah please raise your hands so that uh, you can be unmuted by the host Or you can type in your question in the chat box as well. That's the best way. You know, instead of rising, then unmuting and muting, the best way is to type in your questions if you have any in the chat box itself, the chat window. All right, I think we are good and uh, we are ahead of time. Uh, just uh, on the clock, twelve fifteen. I want to be sensitive about the time, so the next speaker and the entire flow is kind of organized and systematic. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I think uh, MVP being very um, a sensitive and critical point, you know, and the approach is there for the startup uh, budding entrepreneurs. I'm sure the session has helped them. Uh, in case you have any questions related to MVP, uh, please write to us. I will be sharing a month and female ID at the end of the presentation. We will uh, share it to you, sir. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Thank you, ma'am. Again, on my behalf, uh, I wanted to thank uh, the entire month and team and FKCCI organization for organizing this uh, topic. And I was uh, given out for giving an opportunity to share what little I know with the participants. And also, I want to thank all the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll stop sharing the screen. Uh... Okay. Yeah, um, students, I think uh, you all made the you know, made notes because that was a very important topic. Uh, please write to us. As I said, I will be sharing the email ID at the end of the presentation in case you have any doubt before your final presentation, business plan presentation. Um, yes, moving uh, ahead, uh, it gives a you know a proud for FKCCI to introduce the next speaker, Mr. Bharat uh, Rajanna. A founder and CEO of uh, Edupinacle, uh, he won the best business plan uh, competition of Manthan in 2014. Post that, you know, he's won many awards uh, in terms of Young Entrepreneur Award, Best Campus Entrepreneur, awarded by TataFirst.net, and his list goes on. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Bharat Rajana, and it's uh, very nice to see you and, you know, uh, I'm sure in 2014, you were the other side where the students are sitting today. Okay, so you can give us a very practical approach uh, and you know, um, share your best knowledge with them. Yeah, uh, th thank you so much, madam. Am I, am I audible to all of you? Yes, you are. Okay, so hi guys. It's, it's so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to be back here. And let me tell you, it's been 10 years. So since we started our startup, so I had uh, participated in... Uh, 
2013 and 14 that year is where i had done my participation and uh, it was almost 10 years i feel so happy at that month and has contributed to my uh, our startup journey hugely when we we were student like you so what i have decided today is to tell you a few things what i have learned in the past uh, 10 years of my uh, startup journey right so home uh, i hope the ppt is visible the slide shows visible is yes Okay, so what 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 mainly I'll be focusing on is mainly I'll be focusing on uh, to tell me about myself first. Uh, basically, I'm a uh, I run a startup. So now it's not a startup because it's almost ten years. So I run a company where uh, we are into consulting and training. So we do a lot of consulting and a lot of trainings uh, in area of analytics and digital marketing, right? And uh, in last ten years, so this September will be ten. So it's almost less than two three months uh, ahead. And uh, basically, we do more. only in the area of analytics and and uh, in last 10 years what i have what i quickly have done is uh, i have found some nine mantras which i will be sharing with you today so instead of saying it key factors for how to become a successful entrepreneur i'll share you share you nine things which i have learned over period of time and uh, i feel these things are these things have added a lot of value to us as we speak right and mantan being a great platform and uh, being a student uh, you know i i would appreciate most of you because uh, you know this is a very good step what you have taken to participate here to learn a lot of things right so before i start i just want to know which cities you guys are from if at all you quick, quickly can type in which cities you guys are from so it will be helpful for me to understand you know which which all people i'm trying to talk to here you can quickly just type in from which 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 cities you are from so i see a lot of bangalore people here okay okay See a lot of Bangalore, Hubli, Narayan from Hubli. Okay, great. Okay, Davan Giri, Sankeshwar, great. Belgaum. Okay, okay. So th th this means you guys are you guys are active. Okay, sort of. Uh, I just want to see how many of you are listening, how many of you are not. Right. Generally, what happens in online is, uh, you know, uh, people tend to just join and they just you know doze off. Right. So I I, I would uh, uh, give you a commitment that uh, for the next uh, you know half an hour or so, what I'm talking to, I'll make sure I'll talk sense to you. I'll make sure I'll try to add as much as value as possible to you. And uh, you know, I'll I'll take some questions at the last. Right, so maybe last five ten minutes we'll take some questions. So let's just dive in. So to those nine mantras which I have been telling so far, which which I have also learned. I'll give you some examples as we speak. So the first and foremost example which I would first mantra which I would try to give you is always try to solve a problem, don't build one. So what what do I mean by uh, this is uh, when I say about this and and one more small uh, this one just in case if here and there if my internet goes down. uh just let me know maybe i'll repeat that slide right is is that, is that clear just in case because uh, i'm connected to my mobile's internet just in case because of power fluctuation if my internet goes down just let me know right so that i i'll understand right so first thing why why i tell solve a problem don't build one because we are a country of almost 1.4 billion people right so if you don't know in china every 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 month there's a new billionaire right so because they have population is their strength right china doesn't have google china doesn't have facebook they have their own features right so why i am saying solve a problem because india has a very lot of opportunities which we have not yet uh, you know tapped yet so for each one of you there is a lot of problem which you can solve right so generally when you trying to build something what happens is when we were also build, building something we we were trying to build something which people didn't needed at starting So I was listening to the previous speaker. He was telling you to you know iterate a lot of times, pivot a lot of times, which is very very apt in today's scenario, right? So there are a lot of problems which you see. So try to solve them. That's how you know you can you know you can be more successful. Don't try to build one, right? That's what I have learned throughout the process. Let's say during my starting years in 2014, 2015, uh, we we actually wanted to do something which none of our customers wanted it. right but slowly we understood what is the customers wanted what is the customers problems are what is that they really looking for so slowly we try to build it right so that's why this thing is very important always look for a problem and see let's like say for example in, in bangalore most of people in bangalore so we we have seen we have seen online ordering has been you know at a boom in last 5 10 years but there's a new guy who comes in and he says in 10 minutes i'll deliver me the zepto example is what i'm trying to give you let's say i have started cooking and something is missing so can get that good zepto and book something in 5 10 minutes it's there right see how creative things can be right so problems are there everywhere is just that we have to see where the problem is and we have to try to fix it in a more innovative way right that's where the first mantra for you always solve a problem don't build one right 
Then the second one, what I'm finally telling you is be ready to be bored. Why I'm saying this line is because most of you are students who are aspiring to become an entrepreneur is the next. Most of you are, you know, you want to start your own company and all that. So what I tell you is, if at all you want to become an entrepreneur, be ready to be bored. Be ready to see that. Let's say, for example, when you build a startup, you at least you have to devote at least a minimum of 18 months or two years. Because unless and until you don't devote that much time and effort in that particular business or passion you have, you won't see results, right? For example, let's say uh, when I had finished my uh, MBA, MBA is when I had participated for a month. And so I was still a student, right? So it took almost solid two years for us to monetize, make profits, become sustainable and all that. So you should be ready to be poor because, you know, let's say once you finish your college, most of your friends will get placed. Most of your friends will start earning from the next month onwards. Most of the friends will, you know, start enjoying life, which you will see and that peer pressure will start putting on you, right? So you should accept it. This is what you have chosen for and you believe in yourself. You believe your passion. Why did you even start this, right? So if you're not ready to be that poor for that 18 months, don't, don't get into this. This is not for you, right? So the, I had met one uh, person called as Sudhir Khan. So what he said, he was an entrepreneur, he was a serial entrepreneur. His lines influenced me a lot. He said, uh, Bharat, see, if at all you want to become, become an entrepreneur, you should be ready to eat bread, not even butter, not even roti. Any any bread, you should be ready to sleep on floor and you should be ready to sweep your office, everything. So if you don't, if you're not ready for that, you, you can't be, right? So be ready to be poor. That's how you learn a lot of things because we Indians are very good in Jugaad. Let's say you've seen our, uh, you know, how ISRO has been very competitive in the world's market, right? In terms of NASA and all, how we are able to build a same kind of uh, project with a lesser cost. Because we know how to cut costs. We know how to make it in a more frugal way. We know how to build things much better, right? So that's why this point is what I mentioned. This is the second mantra, which I want you guys to take it from me today, right? The third one, do the dirty work yourself. Why, why do I say this is, uh, what happens in, uh, uh, as a startup guys is all, all we have seen a lot of movies and in movies, you know, in, in Rajnikath movies or in any, any Shah Khan movies, what happens is there's one song after the song, the hero is millionaire before the song he's poor. And after the song he's a millionaire, so it's, it's the life doesn't work like that. Right. So, uh, as an entrepreneur or as a, a person who's aspiring to be an entrepreneur, you should, uh, you know, uh, be ready to learn all the work in your company. Let's say, uh, from opening your office, cleaning your office, from doing A to Z, whatever work should, what work is there in your, in your company, you should be aware of each one, one of them. That's how you know, that's how you know the integrity of how things work, how you can fine tune it, how you can change, how you can't change and all that. If you don't do this dirty work, dirty work means what? What I'm referring to here is each and every work you have to try. Each and every work you should know how it works. Then when you know how it works, you're going to delegate it to somebody else. That's where, that's where, you hire somebody and give that work to that person so that he can deliver it much more efficiently, right? But if you have not tried it at all, you'll be always at a blind spot, right? For example, let me tell you something. Uh, what happened with us was in 2015, so we had a tech guy because we were weak in technology at that time. So whatever he says, it was out of the blue moon for us, right? So we don't understand much. So once things started getting rough, once we also started to getting understanding how technology works, how apps work, how it is built, the process of it, slowly we learned how things were working then we understood at the end that this guy was playing around with us right so unless and until you don't do the stuff by yourself you'll not know how to fine tune it right that's what i mean by this particular mantra for you right so th this thing this things are the few things which we have learned in practical right so i only have half an hour or else i i would take days to tell you our experiences or stories of what all we've gone through and trust me it's an amazing journey you can have and being a student why you have this advantage is because you're not, nobody is dependent on you, right? Unless and until, you know, uh, your family is dependent on you. As your student, you are risk-free. What, let's say, for example, today, if at all I want to start something, I'll, I, I'm not that risk-free. I have a lot of EMIs. I have a lot of responsibilities, which I will think twice to start or not. But being a student, you are at a very less risk where, you know, you don't have nothing to lose. Either you learn or either you earn. That, that's, that's all you will do. Right. So the first after, as soon as you finish your studies, first two years is what I feel as personally is a very good time where you can explore. 
right? And you guys have chosen the best thing to at least, you know, you know, put your plans here, you know, get it vetted by most of the mentors who are going to come across in the FKCCI. So it's a brilliant platform, guys. So I have, when we were started, uh, let, let me tell you, uh, for us, the first funding kind of thing came from FKCCI, right? So the first money part, which we put into as a capital, we, we, when we won the prize in 2014, so that money, entire money we put into, you know, bank account saying, this is our capital, this is where, from, where we start from. Right. So this one, do the dirty work yourself, right? Moving forward. Why why call it persistence first? Next patience, next passion is because see, passion, everybody like a lot of people are who are passionate to do a lot of things. But what happens is, you know, it's it's like uh, you know, every day you should be passionate to work, go and work and all that. Only unless and until you're not disciplined, unless and until you're not uh, focused or you're not uh, you know, uh, specifically wanting to do it. If not, if you're not persistent in that, you can't, you can't sustain, right? So unless and until, uh, and patience does a brilliant job. So there, there are a lot of times, let's say 10 years down the lane, uh, we, we do a lot of trainings, we do a lot of consulting work and all that. So in 2014, we went and met so many clients who said, uh, Bharat, uh, we don't want you guys because you guys are still uh, freshers. You guys are still don't have experience and all that. Trust me, 10 years fast forward today, we work with all of those clients who rejected us in 2014. And we work with them as a biggest partners for them. Okay. So that means what? You need to give some time, you need to have some patience, things might not to really work when you start. And one more thing what happens is, uh, when you really start uh, something, you, you might think the product or service which you have built will always make you that million dollars or whatever it is. So don't see the money part always. Try to solve the problem part, which I have told you already so many times. So why why I'm saying this is unless and until you're not ready to adapt, you're not ready to change to the market, it's very difficult to sustain, right? For which you need a lot of patience. So if at all, uh, you know, let's let's go back in 2014, we want to do something. Let's say if I think of it today, I think what we were doing that point of time would have never got us revenue. If at all, we were, we were stick to doing that. What we tried to do was we... How try try to listen to our customers. We try to listen to the market. We try to you know go talk to people. Try to understand what is that they really want. Then slowly is what we started to build. For which you'll need a lot of persistence, a lot of patience. Okay. So and passion is very important. So whenever you go low, you should always understand uh, why did you even really start this. So there there were times where uh, our bank balances were zero, or you know you know there was there was a lot of debt and all that. So, but what kept us going was, why did we even really start? This was, this was our motive to start. So that passion, what you start from, always keep in mind, but you'll need that persistent or that patience is very, very important, right? Patience to learn, patient to accept your failure, patient to, you know, being patient to learn new things, being patient to, you know, explore a lot of new, new things, try new things. Because being an entrepreneur, there's, there's no guide to you. Nobody's going to tell you what is wrong, what is right. Nobody's gonna, you know. Yes, of course. In you know, month and you'll meet meet across a lot of brilliant, you know, helping kind mentors. You'll meet, uh, but at certain point of time in future, as you go forward, a lot of decisions you have to make it alone, right? For which, if you don't have patience, if you don't have persistence, thing things will go very wrong. One one simple mistake can lead, you know, your entire work go for a toss, right? So patience, persistence, and passion is very important. You can call it as three P's in management. That's what. Now we call uh, persistence, patience, and passion, right? So moving forward, the next one is I was telling you was adaptability. So why I call it adaptability is because most of you, whatever product you are trying to build today, I have I've seen a lot of businesses as our, our own business, uh, the product which we initially did or we pitched, pitched in a month and that, that point of time, that never get, got us revenue. Right. Uh, we we only thought that this will give us that much revenue, you know, so many people will buy, so many clients will come. It was all an Excel sheet. Right. But when we actually went to market, we saw nobody wants this. Everybody wanted it, but they want it for free. Nobody wants to pay for it. Right. So slowly somebody said, Bharat, uh, this is good, this is fine, but can you also do this? Can can this also be added to this? Can can we do it like this also? So if at all I see back the last 10 years, if we were not adapting or till today. Especially COVID, uh, you know, uh, gave us a lot of new uh, insights, a lot of new teachings for us where, uh, uh, you know, all of a sudden we saw a drastic shift in the business because, you know, because we are into consulting and training. As soon as COVID hit, uh, most of the offline work got closed, right? And it was all of a sudden. Most of the clients also told us, 
a lot of clients were with us. A lot of clients said it's not required at the moment because everything is online, right? So unless and until we don't adapt. So what we did was whatever we were trying to do, we, we tried to develop a new kind of product, new kind of service. So which we figured out in COVID. So every uh, drawback which we faced, we thought, why can't we do it in a different way? Which led to us to creating a new product, new service. So And also it adds to your uh, overall revenue at the end, right? So if you're not ready to adapt, if at all you're not ready to listen to the customer, if at all you're not ready to the market conditions, so then it's going to be difficult. You should always try to adapt. And being adaptability, what it will do to you is it will always help you to innovate a lot of things. It will always help you to keep the customer satisfied, right? So one thing you have to remember in business is no matter what, at whatever time, whatever customer is always king. Whatever customer wants, you have to deliver it. You might want to deliver more sometimes, but customer won't need it. How much of a customer needs it, you try to add value there, right? So if this is the next mantra, which I want you to take it forward, where if you don't adapt, that's 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 going to be a very big problem, right? So adaptability is one of the key issue if you want to sustain in market, if you don't adapt to different, different conditions, which we have till today. Till today, let me tell you, till today, even, even today morning, we had a meeting where we had to change few services, where we have to reiterate a couple of products, a couple of ways how you work. So it's, it's all learning. And especially in last uh, one one advantage, what, what what most of you have is when we started, we didn't have something called as AI, this ChatGPT, BARD, LLMs, or none of these AIs were there. But today, the technology is much more faster. Let's say you want to build an app, you can do it in the next half an hour. If at all you want to build a website, you can do it in the next five minutes. You want to build a chatbot, maybe you can do it in the next one hour or two hours. So technology is being very, very, very uh, fastly growing and uh, anybody can use it today. Right. So that, that's the biggest advantage what you have today. If at all you ask me, which we didn't have in way back in 2014, but today there are a lot of things that say you want to learn something, you just go to charge GPT, you type, it's going to teach you. You want to build something, you can at least have somebody quickly telling you with all that expertise what to do, what not to do. Right. So adaptability is one of the biggest thing as an entrepreneur, which you should always keep in mind. Right. So the next one is willingness to fail. Why I'm telling willingness to fail is so the, 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 uh, maybe after, once you finish this competition and once you start your business, there are 199% of the chances that your client, potential client might reject you. You're, or you're, you've been delivering to client very efficiently. You've been delivering to client with whatever they want and the satisfaction is high. Still, they might reject you, right? So the re rejection, you know, let, let's say there's the, a the saying generally I say, what, what we also follow. Whenever we lose a client or, and by the way, we, don't, we have not lost any client in last 10 years, right? So, but generally when we uh, try to approach a new client, if that doesn't get converted or whenever we try, we fail in any point of time, we always make sure we go and party that day. Why Why I'm saying, you know, you want to go and party that day because we have learned something which we would have never learned. This will not work so that we know this method won't work. So we can shift to the next method, right? So if you're not willing to fail, that's going to be becoming a very big problem. So as I told you earlier, you know, 2014, when we started, most of us rejected us at that point of time. But today we work with them very closely with a lot of different projects and a lot of them are even our biggest clients today, right? Why? Because we, we try to understand the failure. We try to understand that this is what, not they, what they want. This is what they want us, want, want us to do. This is how they want the product to be delivered. This is what their expectations are. This is what, you know, the market conditions are. So all the internal factors, all the external factors will always play, play its role. Let's say when COVID hit, everything was perfectly fine. But uh, you still fail. You still you know close a lot of things. You still lose revenue. You still do a lot of things. But as an entrepreneur, you should accept it. You should try to innovate it. So what we did was we started our new uh, entire uh, vertical where we tried to do a lot of things online. And that online vertical, which we tried that, that that particular point of time, gets us revenue till today. And we were only restricted only to Bangalore or Karnataka at that point before COVID. But now we have clients from Australia, we have clients from UK, we have clients from uh, US, we have clients from Germany, from different places we have clients. That was only possible because that failure or that hiccup which we faced in 2020 when the COVID came. So whenever there's something something goes wrong, always think that it's happened for your own good. There is something new is going to come, right? So that's what has helped us to tackle any situation in a better way as possible, right? 
so maybe maybe before i go to the next one maybe if uh, i think i have left out with you uh, know i have finished uh, uh, five i have four more left before i go to the next one if anybody has any question maybe quickly i'll take one or two questions then i'll go forward if you have any questions anything you want to ask uh, maybe I'll, I'll quickly pause to just ask for one or two questions then maybe we can go forward maybe you can just type in your questions maybe i'll try to answer that and uh, quickly i'll just also try to tell you what so basically first is what i focused on is solve a problem not build one be ready to be poor do the dirty work yourself be persistent have patience don't ever give up on your passion right and make sure you adapt to whatever changes you come across then willingness to fail so these are the few mantra which i have shared with you today and if there's anything apart from this you have questions i maybe i'll i'll take maybe one or two questions before i go forward i know something what happens is no Now generally what happens uh, uh you know you know there's there's a biryani which is getting prepared i i have already tasted it you guys have not tasted it yet so unless and until you don't taste it you'll not know how it is right that that's how it is so whenever i tell you this points and all that here you'll not understand because you have not experienced that part of it yet but i'm just sharing you things where at least you fail at one point of time where you lose a client or something goes wrong at least you remember this point what i've told you if you fail that day that's because there is something much more bigger things are coming i'd say in covid what happened a uh, couple of our big clients said they paused their projects they said we'll do it after covid so when you when a project is paused you know your fixed expenses are always there in business your salary is your rent and mission your building which you generally pay in business that has to be maintained so when your revenue goes down you know you feel kind of low you find kind of lost but what i would always suggest you to do is when something goes wrong always sit take a moment try to think what 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 other things can be tried what other new things can be tried what what is that market really wants at that point of point of time right so that always gives you a bigger insights where you know you can go ahead and uh, try to do a lot of new new things as you go forward right so as i see there's no questions from anyone maybe maybe at the end we'll take a couple of more questions i'll just move forward so next one learning never ends so why i'm saying learning never ends is because uh, being being an entrepreneur in last 10 years let me tell you most of the things which we do today most of the businesses or services which we have built today 99% of it i never learned in college right but today nowadays colleges are you know encouraging entrepreneurship colleges are you know having their own incubation center colleges been you know more proactive in a lot of things but as an entrepreneur when i think back once your college is finished you should never stop your learning part learning part could be from a client learning part could be from your mentor learning part could be you know taking up a new course right so you should you should always try to learn a lot of new things so till today what habit i have is generally what i would also suggest you to also to do is uh, which in the i do if, if there is any expo the exhibition centers you know in bangalore we have a lot of exhibition centers maybe in palace grounds or in bangalore international uh, exhibition center generally i make a habit of generally going to see go and attend and see what all things have been there it might not be related to me the ex exhibition could be something else a to z which is no way related to my particular domain but still i make a point to go and at least visit which will help me to give a lot of new insights and understand what is happening outside right so or else you'll not know what people are trying to do you'll not know what new things are coming you'll not know what is happening what is not happening right so that mentality of learning always is very 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 damn important from all the points what i've told you if you stop learning if you thought let's say the product what what you're building now and tomorrow you launch it in market you'll make that million dollars and uh, you think you have already made it so let me tell you this that just not that's not how it works so it might work it for that point of time it might work for that particular uh, year but next year there might be something new next year there might be something you know challenging coming somebody else might you know it at much more efficiently right so you should always try to learn a lot of new new things let me tell you one example uh, i told you this do your dirty work yourself no? do this dirty work yourself right so when when we were building uh, edupnakel at 2014 we, we we built our own websites we built our own social media platforms we built our own uh, you know uh, uh, social media pages we built our own promotions we learned it we went to youtube we went to udemy we took a lot of courses we tried to learn and let me tell you one of our vertical which we run today the digital marketing part we learned from scratch by that and digital marketing we do a lot of digital marketing consulting work for a lot of clients today 
and that is only possible because we did that learning at that point of time. That point of time we did it only for a startup. But today, when we see that we are using it practically, you know, earning some revenue for the company, and also you know we 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 delivering good results to our client. You know, throughout home are we working for that. So you you might not know when you're learning something how it will be useful. But that, that, that's how Steve, you know, Steve Jobs generally say, I, I'm a, you know, when we started uh, Edupan you know, those times, Steve Jobs was very, now, nowadays Elon Musk, you know, is very popular in terms of entrepreneurship and all that. But when we, we were starting that time, we were seeing to Steve Jobs, that's what we wanted to become, right? So he, he generally says, uh, you know, you, you can only connect dots looking backwards. So I can connect dots today looking backwards last 10 years, what has happened. So you always will know, you learn something, you might not realize it today, why it is important, but down the lane, you'll 110% you'll realize how it is helping you in your particular process. So learning doesn't mean you have to learn only for your business. It could be anything. Maybe you, if, you, if you don't know swimming, please go and learn. If you don't know how to play a guitar, if you want to go and learn, right? You never know how things things gonna work out, right? So learning is a very crucial thing, even till today. Till today, I make sure uh, I I make sure I push myself to learn a lot of new things because if I don't learn new things. How, how will I you know wait how will I you know uh, build a lot of things how will I try to sustain in the market so and let me tell you uh, in last 10 years we have not raised any money from anyone and we have been profitable year on year we have we have been bootstrapped and uh, we have been sustainable year on year and we have been growing year on year maybe we have been not growing 4400 x 500 x but we are growing at least in two digits growth is what is there in our business every year so that will only happen if learning never ends. And because I've been talking about this, let me also tell you, there are a lot of things where you feel that, uh, you know, uh, you, you think money is the constraint. So money is never a constraint if at all you want to start a business. Money is always the second thing. First thing is how much you are dedicated to that, how much you are willing to put that effort, how much you are willing to put that time into business. That That's very important. Right, and how much you're trying to learn and try to also implement that learning, right? That, th those things are very important uh, when you are, uh, you know, when you when you're still a budding entrepreneur, right? I and I can, uh, I, I I've been in your shoes, I've been there, I know how it feels, I know how it all happens. A lot of times there'll be a lot of days where you'll not even know what you're doing, you'll not even know where to go, what to do, what not to do. Trust me, that's a good thing is happening. If at all you feel like that, that means you are on a right path, right? So going to the next one. Very, very, very important because most of us, most of us are uh, student, uh, and we have, uh, you know, we have been, uh, you know, uh, we don't have any experience, right? So a lot of people say, you know, if at all you want to start something, they'll say go work for two, three years somewhere, then come back and then start, right? But uh, from in my scenario, I never went and worked anywhere else. So one thing which helped me a lot is having a mentor. So always please go find your mentor who's gonna mentor you. Honestly, why I'm saying you honestly is you might meet a lot of people uh, when you're trying to look for a mentor who might try to exploit you, who might try to get some due advantage from you, right? But you should be smart enough to find a mentor who really wants to help you. And there are a lot of people outside. And FKCC also, also has a very brilliant platform where they'll provide you mentors and they're going to help you and assist you in a lot of things. But always remember that mentor is not like a school teacher who will always come back to you and ask you, did you do the assignment? Did you do the homework? No. It's you the one who gonna always go back to them and you the one who will always go back to them and ask, this is what I'm doing, is it right or wrong? This is what is, how, will it work or not? You, this, you are the one who should always go back. And find a good mentor who's gonna mentor you, you know, brutally, honestly, who's gonna tell you what is what, right? So having a mentor has helped me today a lot, which, which you know, if at all I didn't have a mentor at that point of time, maybe I would have closed in 2015 and we would have winded up and I would have went to a job and it would have been done. Maybe I would have not even spoken to you today, right? So have a mentor, which is very crucial because most, I, um, you know, in, in our family background, none of them have a business. Most of them are either farmers or most of them are either in, you know, some government PSU jobs. That, that's what all about is. So nobody has a essence of business as in such. But later I realized the number of big, biggest businessman is a farmer. That, that, that's, how, that's how he takes a risk. You know? So that thing's about, if you have a mentor, he's going to guide you, handhold you, Handled in the sense that he's not going to invest in you. Uh, you know, he's going to tell you what is right, what is wrong. And generally have a mentor who has already done it. Don't have a mentor who has never done something. 
in the sense if he is not a businessman he can't be your mentor he should be a businessman you should have run a business because he'll know the point of how business works right so if at all you choose a person who's not a mentor who's not a businessman he will not he'll never understand how the how business works right so have a mentor who has done that particular part and today with linkedin with uh, fkcc platforms you have a lot of connect you can meet a lot of people and uh, you know there's a lot of things to explore right so having mentor is very important right moving on further stop giving excuses so generally what happens is uh, we humans uh, we think that uh, we'll do today we'll do tomorrow we'll do day after the more the excuses you give the more let's say you give excuse for one month that might go forward for next one year right so why i am telling you to stop giving excuses is because uh, because you're building something from new the lot of opportunities where we have got if we were not there at that point of time at the right time we would have never got that client right there a lot of instances where if at all we thought that let's skip this meeting let's not go with this it's not working out and let's focus on something you know if at all we had started giving excuses a lot of point of time most 90% of our clients would have never turned out today right so in business luck is very important being there at the right time is very important if at all you have that stuff if at all you can deliver all those things right so for first most thing you should stop giving excuses unless and until you don't stop it it keeps on going that there is a saying you know uh, until you say tomorrow 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 never comes right tomorrow tomorrow is always tomorrow it's not today it's not now so you should always say now today we cannot do it right so stop giving excuses that's a very 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 day you know after some point of time uh, we are humans we'll try to procrastinate we'll try to you know push things i, I also procrastinate a lot of things even till today which i also try to not to do you know we learn through our failures we learn through our mistakes right but one thing you should always have in mind is okay today i have given excuse tomorrow i have one week one month but how much more can i give right so one point of thing what i had in mind is if i don't do it today who else will right this this entire passion which i spoke to you in the starting if this, this if this passion is yours you have started it why 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 you know why can't you continue it right so you are just avoiding it by giving excuses saying that you know maybe i'll work for two years maybe i'll do this maybe i'll do that maybe 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 tomorrow i'll do this so that that will never happen right so stop giving excuses just jump in and try right so that that's how that's how you will learn right so this is my ninth mantra which i'm giving you today so stop giving excuses and try so as to come back to what we do today we we also do a lot of training and certifications we have been working with a lot of clients and so far we have trained more than 60 60000 people we have trained you know in last uh, 10 years and uh, once once we see back today uh, that there's a lot of things we have learned there's a lot of mantras i i want to share with you but uh, this sort of nine things which i feel is very important and when you see somebody successful that, that's what this image which i have put you know maybe i have spoken to you for half an hour today telling about how things are there and being successful is not a destination is what i feel it's not you reach there it's done it's a continuous process let's say to, today we, we have been profitable it's a continuous process we have to keep on doing it we have to keep on innovating it we have to keep on you know uh, trying to learn new things trying to innovate trying to bring in a lot of new stuffs it's a it's a continuous process right so if you stop that process it's gone so that's why i say you know what what, what people see success is very little and let me tell you success has many fathers failure is always an orphan nobody wants failure right but if you fail at something remember something good has happened to you don't worry you're on the right track get back right again get back right again that's what swami vivekananda says right so when when we were starting this i read a book on swami vivekananda that he says that uh, you know he was walking barefooted i'll tell you a small example he was till today it it, it affects my mind a lot right so there was a story that he was walking to mountains uh, in his initial days swami vivekananda then uh, one of the person asked are you mad why are you walking barefooted you know towards mountain there's a lot of stones a lot of thorns it might prick you so swami says that uh, yes there are a lot of stones yes there are a lot of thorns but it will always be under my feet not up my on my head same like problems are always under your feet it's you are the one who's going to take it on your head right so for every problem there's a solution just that you should tackle it in a different way right so on this note uh, i think i have still 5 or 10 minutes left if there's any questions from anyone i would be happy to take and i would be happy to answer uh, if any of you have any questions 
and uh, before uh, you know we, we talk about questions uh, let me uh, congratulate you most of you have you uh, know uh, you know i have uh, you know uh, done a very good work or you know this is the best thing which you have done in your life let me tell you which you might not realize it today fast forward 10 years you will understand why i told you this you are there at the right platform and i was also there in 10 years back this platform has helped me i i i listened to ketaki madam you know in couple of uh, you know minutes back she spoke about a lot of things so she also mentored us at that point of time in a first knowledge workshop and right lot of value which mantan adds you you know we learned how to build a business plan at that point of time where in fkcgi mantan is where we learned it for the first time right so there were a lot of things we learned and till today if at all you ask me in our startup mantan Hi. contributed in a very big way right if at all uh, you know we were students out of the blue moon and somebody gave us chalo take 50000 do your you know go live your dream if somebody did no month did, did that for us at that point of time if nobody did at that point of time maybe we would have you know we would have thought a student project and we would have closed it there right so you are there in a brilliant platform make use of it go talk to people and one thing is go always ask what you want anybody you ask they might tell you no or yes so you are nowhere at loss if it happens it will happen if not if not right so make use of the platform to the full extent and uh, i'm always available to reach out in any mediums and you can just find me on linkedin my my, my name is bharat rajna so i'll be happy to you know talk to you guys if anybody wants to talk and uh, maybe i have five more minutes left uh, if there's any questions i'll be happy to take or else we can move on to the next speaker hi bharat thank you for a wonderful presentation uh, and congratulations on your upcoming 10th anniversary um you had mentioned regarding mentors um sometimes mentors ask for sweat equity which is basically asking for uh, you know equity in exchange for the guidance or the mentorship that they will give you what is your thought about that uh so let's say if at all the mentor is asking for equity sweat equity and all that so as an entrepreneur what i would do is at this point of time you uh, know uh, maybe i'll assess how much value the mentor is adding to me is the is the is the values in terms of is, is he going to give me some connect where it will help me to convert some clients or is he going to add a lot of let's say for example i don't have that skill if the mentor is adding that skill which is going to affect my business a lot then yes i would consider giving sweat equity but if it's just that one hour of guidance or two hour of guidance he's going to guide me on something and just leave it off then i might consider you know should we do it or not but in initial stages finding a mentor you know generally initial stages sweat equity you know because you have been not understanding your business a mentor also what i feel you not expect at initial stages but after a while maybe after a while a business is profitable then yes mentor should ask for sweat equity because business is profitable right when business is profitable i feel mentor mentor has a right to ask sweat equity but until business is not profitable i think mentor also should be able to you know uh, help the entrepreneur to try trying to understand you know help him to understand where is he going wrong where is he going right then when he is really getting profitable businesses growing yes he has to demand so dignity because it is right that's what i uh, i generally personally feel thank you bharat any other questions anybody have so i see one question on chat box uh, what do you consider friends and partners in the field as so generally uh, uh, while selecting a team always don't select a team because he is your close friend don't have somebody in your team because he is your uncle aunt or your brother or sister have somebody in a team if you have that skill find somebody who has something some of the skill which you don't have always have people who can complement your skills always have somebody who can you know if you're doing a the other person can do b not the same a work right so always have a team when you're building make sure you build a team where you know they have a different skill sets that that's going to help you in a longer run right so any any other questions you guys have I'm just sort of just organized. So I have one question from Aman. Sir, uh, personal question: How did you manage the startup just after graduating? You said never get a job, continue startup from the beginning. You didn't face any confidence issues. Yeah. yeah. So the, Aman, I tell you that the, the lot of lot there's lot of days that there, there was there wasn't a day where I thought why I'm doing this. There there wasn't a day where I thought you know can't I quit this. There wasn't a day where I thought uh, this is not gonna work. So as an entrepreneur, I always felt sometimes even today today I feel that why should I you know work so much. so that uh, negativism is always there but one thing which i always do is which i would tell you also to do is believe in yourself give it time and i would suggest you is give it that solid 18 months of time if after 18 months also it's not working out maybe somewhere you're going wrong but give it 18 months of time where generally as a rule book where you need 18 months 
to figure out if the startup is working or not. And in the process, you figure out a lot of things. So you will face a lot of issues. Nobody is confident all the time. Fear of failure is there every day. Right. But what keep, kept, kept me going was the passion and uh, why did I really even start? Right. For example, let's say after a year, quitting and going back to job is okay. That can be done any day. If I quit after one year or two year or three year or today, if at all I quit and go, I get a job. Job is not a problem. But why did we even really start this? Why do you even really, you know, did all so many, so many things to bring some change in society, right? To bring some change in the environment where we work. So don't forget to have that passion and always believe in yourself. That's what I always do when I feel low. I hope it answers your question, Anna. Is there any other question? Okay, there's no questions. I think, uh, thank you so much, FKCCI, for uh, calling me back. It, it always feels like uh, coming back home whenever I come back to FKCCI and talk to all of you. And I'm very happy and very grateful for what FKCCI has given us. Uh, Mantan especially has uh, given us, you know, and I would uh, strongly appreciate and, you know, uh, you know, uh, request FKCCI to continue doing this and continue, you know, uh, you know, building more, you know, entrepreneurs, for our nation and uh, I'm always there if anything is required. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Bharat. Uh, you've given a very clear picture of what's now and what's next uh, for the uh, young entrepreneurs there and your story itself is a great learning definitely. Now all the points were very uh, apt. Um, at this point, I thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, I'm sure the students, in case they have any questions related to this topic, we will write to you. Thank you so much, Bharat. I also welcome uh, Ankur sir for joining us today. Thank you, Ramya. So uh, moving on uh, ahead, uh, we have uh, our next speaker for the day, Mr. Sridhar uh, Rajgopar. He's a chief mentor, uh, Redefined Groups. He provides project management, consultancy, and technological solution to over 40 manufacturing companies in India. Bangladesh, Jordan, Ethiopia, and many more countries. Well, I welcome you, sir, and over to you. Oh, yeah, you have unmuted me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, the FKCCI team. This is my first, uh, first session with uh, FKCCI, and... Uh, the last few days, uh, uh, when Mr. Nagaraj called me about Manthan, I wasn't aware that such a program does exist. And it's so nice to see uh, a lot of participants, close to about 140 participants. And uh, it's, I, I really feel good uh, speaking to all of you this afternoon. Um, my name, as you all know, is Sridhar Rajgopal. I, I head uh, three companies under the Redefine Group. We are primarily uh, doctors to companies that are not doing well. Uh, just like how we go to doctors when we are not well, uh, companies come to us when they are not well. That's exactly what we do for a living. Uh, we we transform organizations so they become more competitive, uh, responsible, and sustainable. That's that's exactly what we focus upon. Um, being an entrepreneur is is, is an amazing journey uh, because I have been one. Uh, actually, this is my second stint as an entrepreneur the last 13 years, uh, before which... Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, I was also an entrepreneur then. Uh, but in between, I I went back into the went into the corporate world, and and that's when actually I honed a lot of skills. In fact, I always very clearly emphasize that working in a good organization that is proactive, and that is systematic, and that's got a long long term vision and and view of growth, is is what is much required for a for a for an entrepreneur. Uh, having said that, even if you're working in an organization and you are the CEO or a COO or or you are a director or whatever, you're still an entrepreneur because that basically means you are both driving a, a process as well as driving a set of people. So entrepreneurship does not uh, just restrict to somebody who owns a company, but even if you are leading a team of professionals and uh, leading a team that is out to achieve a process improvement or whatever, you are still an entrepreneur in that case. Uh, for today, I've been asked to speak on a very interesting subject. I have a few slides, if you could kindly allow me to present. Sure. 
sure they are. Wonderful. So for today, I've been asked to speak on the subject of uh, basics of marketing and sales strategy for budding entrepreneurs. I just included the word budding there, uh, primarily because even if you're an entrepreneur for 20 or 25 years, you're still a budding entrepreneur because there's so much for us to learn and relearn and unlearn and so on and so forth. Uh, so primarily what I'm going to do is I'm going to share, I'm going to take you all back to the basics of the definition of marketing and sales and things like that. But more importantly, I'm going to be sharing some anecdotes with you, which I'm sure is what is going to be the actual uh, masala in the whole presentation in the sense that those anecdotes are actually what are actually going to trigger your thought process in terms of uh, redefining uh, what the definition or what uh, the concept of sales and marketing fundamentally stand for. See, before we get into the the, the presentation on the sales and marketing side, I would, uh, as always, like to emphasize on the on the fact and the importance of the subject of integrity. Uh, because without integrity, uh, we are nothing. Uh, whether you are a working professional or whether you're an entrepreneur or whatever, or or even if you are just a, a citizen of the country, uh, integrity is, is of utmost importance. And this is something which should be the true north for all, uh, all people, whether you are, uh, whoever you are, whether you are a working professional or an entrepreneur or whoever. Integrity basically means that our true north is aligned with doing the right things at the right time in the right way and uh, with absolute sincerity and so on and so forth. I always make sure that the, the subject of integrity is brought about uh, because I have seen companies with amazing products, an amazing vision, with deep pockets, but those companies having gone down the road fundamentally because they were they were not very strong in the subject of integrity. So my first request to you is uh, to reinforce your committed commitment to being uh, 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 full of integrity, and this takes you a long way. Being in, uh, in integrity takes you a very long way. Uh, moving on, let's just just brush our knowledge on on the difference between marketing and sales because. Many times there is a confusion. People think that marketing and sales are the same. Uh, but let's just go back to this simple diagram which talks about where the concept of marketing exists and where the concept of sales exists. Marketing, as you can see in the diagram, is, is what you do in the initial stages wherein you are primarily trying to understand what you want to do, what is it that you want to offer the society, what is it that you want to be offering your clients and so on and so forth. And not just about identifying uh, what product or service, but also going deep down into doing a lot of research. See, one thing is uh, of utmost importance. Uh, before you become an entrepreneur, there has to be a lot of research, not just on the product or service, but I encourage you to do a lot of research on yourself as well, because you need to know who you are. A real entrepreneur, starts with a very firm uh, foot on uh, on uh, footing on what he or she stands for. So uh, as thorough research on yourself is absolutely important because you need to know your own uh, strengths and weaknesses before you actually venture out. So marketing primarily does a lot of research. There is a lot of study that goes on into why should you be in that space? Uh, there is uh, there are different schools of thoughts. Some people start off uh, with the concept of trying to solve a societal problem, but I don't subscribe to that because uh, the moment you take a position of solving a societal problem, that means you are actually putting a lot of burden on your own shoulders. And I've seen companies crumble from that pressure uh, because they assume that they are here to go out there and solve a society problem. Uh, which, in my opinion, is not the right way to take off. The best thing to do is to identify your own strengths, your own commitment to yourself as to what you would like to do, and then get into identifying what a product or service uh, that you can actually offer the industry. Uh, why I say that is because many a times uh, people think that uh, there is a demand for a particular product or service in the industry, and they just go and jump in there without preparation, without their own commitment to how good or, uh, or how strong they are on that particular subject. So coming back to this, marketing is all about understanding uh, what is the situation, 
where do you want to do what do you want to do and 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 then start looking at where do you want to position yourself because um uh, we, we most more often than not we think that our solution is the best we think our product is the best uh, little knowing that there there could be so many others out there in the industry who had better products who had a better service uh, uh, outcome but for some reason they may uh, would have succeeded or they may not have succeeded either so this research should should be so thorough your research during the marketing process should be so thorough that uh, that you should be uh, that you should be having complete awareness of why you're doing what you're doing once this basic marketing is done then you start looking at the sales process wherein you start identifying who are the key who are the uh, the people that you would want to target what kind of uh, uh, market segment what kind of societal segment and so on and so forth then you start generating those leads and once those leads are generated then you look at how to convert them and close the deals and so on and so forth and then eventually look at money uh, a word of caution here um from my experience of 31 years uh, having been having worked around the world uh, i have primarily spent a lot of time working with uh, organizations big and small my smallest client would be a probably a 30 crore company and the biggest client is a, a right now is a 800 million dollar company so that's the range with which in which i am working what i realize is that if you get into marketing or sales just with the opinion or an idea of making money then i'm sorry to say you will not be able to go too far uh, making money is is the outcome of what you would do if you do your marketing research well if you do your sales program well then the outcome is is good revenue but if you start with the premise that i want to have a 30% margin and then you try to do something i'm very sorry to say you won't go too far because the whole context of why you're doing what you're doing is uh, misplaced in this case uh, moving on uh, a few again going back to the basics uh, let's look at some of the features of uh, uh, differentiating features between marketing and uh, sales i'm sure um, all of you know about these things but i thought it's better that i just brush up uh, so that we are all on the same page and understanding what we are trying to do primarily the focus of marketing is creating demand and brand awareness whereas the focus of uh, uh, sales is converting leads the primary activity in marketing is about advertising research content development and so on whereas the primary activity in sales is about negotiating and and closing the order the goal of marketing is to create market presence and identify methods for brand loyalty whereas the goal of sales is revenue and and making money the 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 fee, the interactions of marketing is di indirect whereas the interactions during sales is direct the measure of success for marketing is the reach the engagement the brand perception and the depth whereas the 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 success measure for sale is just your sales figure how many did i sell what's the kind of margin did i make and so on and so forth so broadly i want you to keep these two things in mind so that you are very clear what you are actually doing because i don't want you to go in and attempt marketing from a sales perspective and vice versa that is attempting a sales from a marketing perspective you need to be very clear about the differentiating factor between uh, these two elements now uh, we spoke about strategy everybody drops the word strategy but uh, strategy actually means different uh, things to different people but in this context i want you to realize that in this context strategy means a clear long term goal with a clear plan on how to reach that goal let's keep it very simple let's not get into uh, the the uh, the complex definitions of of uh, management systems and or management tools and so on and so forth the simplest definition of strategy is having a long term goal and a plan on how to reach that goal similarly a plan of action on how you would actually like to uh, set the objectives for the organization that's so important it's not just about setting obje uh, objectives or goals for yourself but you need to have very clear objectives uh, as part of the strategy for the organization as well and uh, whatever strategy you create it should basically reflect 
your own strengths and weaknesses and that of the company as well, which means the team and so on and so forth. This is also very crucial because uh, initially as an entrepreneur, you will have to do everything right from the office boy to the director of the company, you will be doing everything. But that's great experience because that's when you learn what kind of processes and controls need to be set in. So I want you to be very clear that your strategy as an entrepreneur should be very plain, should be very straightforward, should be goal oriented and should be derived from your own strengths and weaknesses. That's very, very important. Uh, moving on, uh, let's understand what happens to an organization without a strategy. If an organization does not have a marketing or a sales strategy, what do you think will happen? It's very simple. Without strategy, they will be all over the place. There will be no direction. There will be no proper planning. There will be a lot of duplication. There will be a lot of uh, dropping the ball between the chair and so on and so forth. But with a clear strategy, it will be a single-minded focus on what the organization would like to do and achieve. Um, I'm sure you all heard of SWOT analysis. Uh, this is something that you should be, in fact, I encourage you to do a SWOT analysis of yourself and of your organization every month. In fact, I still do it. Uh, my, even though this is my 31st year in, the, in, in, in anything and everything to do with, with businesses, but I do a SWOT analysis of myself every month. I do a SWOT analysis of all my companies every month. This is very much required because this gives you an insight into how you are actually thinking, how you are performing. Same thing with your organization as well. In fact, a SWOT analysis of your organization every month uh, during the MMR meetings, when you start doing your monthly review meetings, I would encourage you to do a SWOT analysis with your teams so they also understand the importance of measuring uh, where we are today and where we are lacking today and so on and so forth. Moving on, I just want to bring you to a very interesting um, thought process. Uh, see the words Xerox, Fevicol and Bisleri for that matter. These three organizations, their marketing strategy has been so strong that even their competitors many times use their names. Like for example, I'm sure there are many, many uh, companies that manufacture uh, uh, Fevicol or other adhesives. But I am also very confident that their competitors themselves use the word Fevicol many times. So, uh, similar thing with Xerox. Like, for example, whenever we want a photocopy done, the first thing we say is get it Xeroxed. Even though Xerox is actually a name of a company. Similarly with uh, drinking water. Bisleri is just one brand. There are so many other brands. But there are many people who have got stuck to the name of Bisleri, Fevicol or Xerox in this case. Now, why do you think this happened? Primarily because these three companies had a, an excellent marketing strategy wherein they flooded information into the minds of people in the society about what their uh, objective and what their support to the world or the society is. For example, Fevicol always said, Fevicol Kajod. You know, they showed you advertisements wherein it is all about adhesives working phenomenally well. So well that, that it is difficult for people to pluck it away from whatever the adhesive has been used for. Similarly with Xerox and similarly with Bisleri. Now, what these companies did is in the primary stages of their business, they invested a lot of money in creating a very robust marketing strategy. That marketing strategy actually sliced and diced the industry, sliced and diced the customer base, sliced and diced the stakeholder base, and they injected very strong messaging and the branding uh, messages into these areas of focus. They did not just uh, create advertisements and, and just blindly post advertisements on the television or the newspaper or wherever, but they did it in a very, very strategic manner so much so that even after 30 years, the words Xerox, Fevicol and Bisleri still hold good. In fact, just recently I was watching the advertisement of, uh, uh, or rather watching an interview of uh, the organization that manages the advertisement for Fevicol. In fact, he was mentioning 
that even today, uh, the the advertisements or the messaging that takes place from from Fericol and their company is is undergoing constant change. They are constantly upgrading the message, the marketing message, which is helping them to be very fresh in the minds of the consumers and of the people in the society. So these three are excellent examples of what a strong marketing strategy can do for an organization. Um, let me just move on to the next slide. Uh, fundamentally, if we look at a 5W2H of marketing, you should be able to answer these questions. The what, why, where, when, who, how, and how, how much. I'm sure you all know this fundamental concept. The what of a good marketing strategy should answer what is the product and service are we offering and what are the marketing goals, whether you want to go into multiple countries, multiple districts, multiple cities or whatever. So there has to be an absolute clarity in what you actually want to be doing there. The why should answer, why are we doing this? Why are we marketing our product? Why are we marketing this service of ours? And this should also talk about why should the customer buy from you? Because at the end of the day, there has to be a differentiating factor. Otherwise, you will also be running along with your uh, competitors and both of you will not achieve what you want to achieve. So we need to have something differentiating, something that our customers specifically will look forward to buying or, or using our services. Then moving on, it's about the where. Where are we going to position our product and service? Who are the targeting target customers that we are looking at? And then the timing. Timing also absolutely is, is of essence here because when you launch your product or when you are reaching out for a marketing strategy is very, very crucial. Like, for example, uh, a paint company uh, will start more of their marketing strategy exercises just as the monsoon is getting over. You know, they, they will not, you will not see many paint advertisements during monsoon. Right? It will be just as the monsoon is getting over, you will see a lot of paint advertisements or cement advertisements that are out there. Because uh, once monsoon is over, people are ready to repaint their homes and repair their homes and buildings and so on. So the when is also very, very crucial. Then who is, is, is of utmost importance? Because who are we targeting? And who is going to be following up with the customer? That's also very important. Now, how talks about how are we going to take our product and service into the industry? Uh, that's also very crucial and which needs a lot of deliberations. You will have to have a lot of iterations and reiterations on these subjects. And the lastly, how much? How much are we actually going to willing to spend? How much deep are we actually willing to go into meeting the needs of the customers is something that also needs a lot of uh, thought thinking and thought processes. Now, similarly, uh, uh, before I go into the 5WTH2H for sales, I just want to talk about two companies that have excellent sales strategy. Interestingly, both these companies, you will not see many of their advertisements. Like, for example, I don't know if you have heard of this company called Juki. It's a Japanese company that manufactures sewing machines, tailoring machines. See, this company, I have been following them since almost about 22, 23 years now. They are doing a sales of worth about $4,000 million every year. And on an average, every year, they sell 5 million machines. Interestingly, Juki is having a stronger sales strategy as compared to a marketing strategy. I have interacted with some of their senior leadership uh, a few years ago because we did some joint projects together. And what I realized is that their investment into their sales strategy is much, much more higher than it is into their marketing strategy. That's basically because initial days, they invested a lot in their marketing, uh, 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 you know, uh, in creating a marketing program. But over a period of time, they realized that their marketing strategy has put them on the track and now they are on a fast-paced growth using their sales strategy. Same thing with Bajaj Finance as well. You will not see much of their advertisements or much of their efforts on marketing, but you will see a lot of their efforts on, on sales. Every day, I'm sure many of us receive two or three calls from them, even though it is perturbing, but their 
sales strategy is about constant connecting constant calls constant messaging to the to the to their customers so these two examples very beautifully tell us that yes you need a marketing strategy but over a period of time you may be in a situation where your sales strategy demands more investments more time and more of your efforts in growing your revenue this is a very classic case and i encourage all of you to read up about uh, juki machines and their success in the in in the world market they are a, you will not find any of their advertisements you will not find a juki advertisement on tv or wherever but they are so much integrated into the industry world over that in almost 180 countries their machines are sold that's a very classic case that you can actually study as far as a robust sales program or sales uh, strategy is concerned uh, going back the the 5w2h for sale is also very important what are we selling and what are our sales goals why are we selling and why are we offering this product and why should the client buy only from us where are we selling and where are the people likely to buy our product or service that's also very important again the concept of timing is very crucial when are we selling it and when are the clients more likely to buy because just as the saying goes uh, umbrellas are sold just before monsoon or during monsoon during summer uh, there's not much of umbrella sales right i just want to share one interesting concept with you i travel a lot world over and one of my most favorite destinations is china uh, the last 22 years i have traveled uh, very very deeply into china and i know the industrial product uh, pro, uh, industrial areas too well in fact, there is a place in Shenzhen uh, uh, where there is a building called the Lohu Market. It's a it's a multi-story building with about 6,000 shops where the world's best fake goods are sold. In fact, what I uh, what I've studied in Shenzhen Lohu Market is they have an amazing sales strategy, and what they basically do is, for example, on the sixth floor, if you went to a watch shop and saw a beautiful watch and you negotiated, but he did not bring the price. Believe me, just as you're walking down and exiting the building, somebody else will come and show you the same watch and will try to sell you the sale, uh, to make a sale of that particular watch. That's how much these guys are excellent salespeople. So if somebody wants to learn the best of sales techniques, there is a lot of opportunities for us to visit multiple places and go and try to sell. In fact, another uh, classic area where you can uh, learn sales strategy is going to a sari shop because people working in the sari shop, predominantly men, are excellent sales uh, people and they have an amazing strategy on sales. So sari shop is another a place where you can actually go and learn your sales strategy. And... Uh, who are we selling, how are we selling, and how much are we selling are also very crucial elements that are need to be that need to be defined and reiterated multiple times during the process of your business. Uh, moving on, um, uh, why marketing strategies fail and why sales strategies fail? This I thought is important for you to understand, even though. Uh, even though there are many more areas or many more uh, uh, reasons why marketing and sales fail, but these are on the top of the line, which we see very often. Like, for example, incomplete market research, uh, unclear value proposition, poor targeting, weak branding and positioning, ignoring market feedback, unrealistic expectations, lack of measurements. These are all common reasons why marketing strategies fail. On the sales side, not studying the customer needs, poor customer connect, incapable sales staff, lack of training, unable to generate leads, sales process is weak and inconsistent, or emphasis on price, sale at any cost. The sale at any cost is the danger, most dangerous thing. Many times salespeople just want to achieve their sale at any cost, which in my opinion is not at all a good idea. So these are some of the reasons why a marketing or a sales strategy may fail. And um, lastly, I just want to touch upon the mindset that is required to drive uh, robust marketing or sales programs. When it comes to marketing, there is a need for a lot of creativity, empathy, 
analytical thinking, adaptability, communication, that is mass communication, strategic thinking, research abilities, and passion for learning. See, passion for learning is very, very crucial. Many times what happens is I see people are very creative, but over a period of time, they stop learning. And once they stop learning, the creativity also dies away. So creativity and passion for learning are actually interrelated. And to be a good uh, marketing strategist, these are points that you need to be very strong upon. On the other hand, if you want to become an excellent sales strategist, then you should have the resilience. You should have a lot of patience, tons and tons of patience, customer-centric approach, leasing mannerisms and etiquette, of course, optimism, problem-solving abilities, quick thinking, Ability to convince, time management, collaboration, and integrity. Why I put integrity in the sales side is basically because you are actually dealing with one person who is uh, who's looking at buying your product or service. So if you're not honest, then you have actually lost one customer. And once you lose one customer, then there is a chance that there are going to be a plethora of customers that you will be losing because one unethical practice in making a sale will actually trigger the habitual uh, need for you to do something that is out of integrity. So I request you as, as, as entrepreneurs to be very, very cautious in positioning yourself uh, as a marketing strategist or a sales strategist. You can't do both. So if you're building a team, you need to have a separate team that works on the marketing strategy part. You need to have a separate team that works on the sales strategy part. So I think with that, I have nothing more to say other than emphasizing on the need for high levels of integrity, uh, which is required with, irrespective of whether you are a marketing professional or a sales professional. And of course, uh, being a responsible citizen in the country and, and in the world needs uh, and expects us to be in a lot of integrity. So with that, I stop my presentation. And if there are any questions, I would love to take them up. And uh, uh, just so you know, I, I mentor organizations and I mentor people also. I am right now mentoring about 28 youth in 11 countries. And it's an amazing experience because every interaction that I have with the youth is not just learning for them, but it's, it's a lot of learning for myself as well. So with that, I stop my presentation and I thank uh, FKCCI for having given me this great opportunity to interact with you. And uh, I look forward to many more such uh, sessions and, and I'm always available. Thank you and uh, over to the, the administrator of the call. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I'm sure we'll take the uh, questions now. Students, you can type in your questions or please raise your hand. We will unmute you. Yeah, students, you can unmute and please you can talk. So, any questions you have, then please, uh, we have 10 more minutes, because Sir has given you know, such varied global examples to students. I'm sure uh, sales is being uh, a very important uh, quotient of entrepreneurship. I think you should have few questions, which uh, we can take it now. Actually, it's okay that if you don't have questions, uh, but I want you to internalize whatever we discussed. Uh, it, it's okay not to have questions. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely fine with it. But I really want you to be very, very careful about internalizing the points. What I have done is an MBA in marketing, I've actually concisely given it to you in 25 minutes. Oh. And, and I've stressed upon where people go wrong. So yeah. just internalize, do a lot of internalizing. I think there's somebody who's asking a question. Yes. 
How to reach target sales and does it matter to meet the target sales? <laughs> it matters if you want a promotion, if you want your bonus, it matters, no doubt about it. At the same time, if you're an organization, if you want to run your organization successfully, then you need profits because you're going to run your company out of the profits. So irrespective of whatever it is, whether you are into sales or marketing, you need to have targets and you need to do anything and everything possible to meet those targets. Otherwise, there's no point in running a business, right? Yeah. Even NGOs have targets. Do you know that? Even not-for-profit organizations have targets because that is when their funders will know whether the money is being invested properly or not. So targets and, and object goals and objectives are common for any and every kind of organizations. Best practices to target my industry customers and reach them, how to do a market research? I think that's a very wide question. Uh, I think you need to refine your question because research happens uh, pre, during, and post any business. Before you want to start your business, you need to have uh, uh, research. During the time that you're running your business, you need to have research. And once your business is running well, also you need to do research. So research on uh, is something that is absolutely constant. Research is like breathing. You know, uh, as long as you're alive, you breathe, right? So similarly, organizations need to have research at every stage. How to do marketing plan for service products? Yes, of course, because even if you are into service, you are actually trying to conquer a certain market share, isn't it? You will have, like, for example, if you are into uh, servicing of refrigerator, for example. So first thing you need to understand how many refrigerator service, uh, service guys are in Bangalore uh, or whichever town you live in. And you need to research on how many of them are doing well, how many of them are not doing well, how many opened and closed, how many are able to grow. And not just that, you need to do research on how many people have refrigerators in that city, first of all, right? So a lot of research need to go into it, irrespective of whether it is a product or service. And more so, a lot of research has to go into your own company, your own strategy, your own people. So 100%, whether you are into service or products, research is a must, sir. First question. Yeah. For a service oriented product, how should we plan yeah, the marketing? Exactly what I answered just now. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Students, do we have any more questions? Yes. That's an amazing question. The moment you say defense, it is defense of the realm, defense of our country. So, uh, it again depends on what you are doing. Like for example, one of my clients, uh, they manufacture components for the defense industry. And uh, to uh, if you ask me whether they should have very good marketing plan, 100% yes. Because again in their sector, there are many competitors. Again in their sector, there is a lot of uh, uh, opportunity for new businesses. So. Uh, national defense is probably the overarching concept under which your business may fit in. And needless to say, you need to have a very good marketing and sales plan as well. Even if you are uh, a component manufacturer that is exclusive for defense. Yeah. See, uh, there is an, a very interesting question you've asked. Initial surveys, uh, you do it yourself. See, what happens is uh, there are organizations that do surveys also, but you need to present the right questions so that they ask the right questions. If you are not clear with the third party that you are choosing, then obviously the questions that they ask is also not going to help you. So a lot of homework has to be done by you before you select the organization that does the survey for you. I would recommend that in the initial stages, you and your team also do the field survey. You go with those organizations, 
you also interview 100 people, 200 people or whatever number because first-hand information you will be acquiring from them. Yes, there are many different methods of doing surveys, but you should identify what is most relevant and suitable for your type of business. And there's one more, probably the last question, metrics and KPIs. What metrics should you find most important to track the... See, again, it's a very important uh, and a very, very vast subject. In fact, uh, I do training workshops on KPIs and performance management. And uh, to cover this topic, I will probably need about four and a half to five hours. That's how much deep the subject is. Here, it is not just straightforward. You cannot say that I have two salespeople and each of you have to get me five orders a day. That's not how it works. There are several elements that need to be brought in in terms of ascertaining these KPIs and, and other KRAs and other measurements. Can I request that some other day we go deep into that subject because uh, I don't want to do injustice to that important subject. And as I told you, I take at least four, four and a half hours to run a workshop on that subject. So if you don't mind, uh, we can probably park this important question for some other day uh, because I don't want to give you half information or, or misleading information. So if you don't mind, we can probably uh, request uh, FKCCI to organize a specific program on that subject. And I would be more than honored to take up that subject. Definitely. Yeah. How to handle objections from a prospects during sales pitch. I think it's all about convincing. See, if you are married, then you will handle sales very well. <laughs> because there is always an argument with no uh, disrespect. What I'm saying is it's all about uh, argument, but it's argument with a proper presentation. Then your sales is successful. If you just hold on to your own sentence and expect the customer to change, that will never happen. Your response has to vary and change along with the change in the customer's expectations. If you do that, then you will be able to achieve very good uh, success out of objections. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yes. Sure, I can. Yeah, my, my number is with Mr. Nagaraj of FKCCI. So uh, you can probably reach out to FKCCI and through that we can connect. But one thing is for sure, I am always available. I, I love to mentor youth and, and I'm always available. So anything that we can do, uh, I'm, I'm open to it. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. That means a lot. We will definitely, uh, you can find sir on LinkedIn and uh, we will also share the sir's email ID. Um, thank you so much, uh, Shridhar, sir, I think uh, for sharing your knowledge and rich experience with our budding entrepreneurs. Sure. The very global examples that you've given uh, means a lot because uh, sales and marketing, is, I, as I earlier said, is a very important uh, thing in, you know, when uh, students are thinking of starting something because there's a lot of risk. So you have given a uh, lot of examples which will help them. And thank you so much for your time, sir. We will definitely take that suggestion of yours and uh, have another session. Sure. Thank you and Jai Hind, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. You. So students, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, for two days because your uh, you know, your focus, your presence uh, yesterday and today shows how much focused you are um, and you know how much you want to uh, uh, move ahead with your startups. So just to give you a few important points, uh, you will have to submit, resubmit your business plan com uh, presentations within four days. You will definitely receive uh, emails from uh, FKCCI, that is month and email ID. In case you have any queries, please drop us an email uh, that will be uh, typed to you now. Can you please type uh, month and email ID? Month and uh, so that, okay. Okay, so anything you want to write to us, please uh, copy the email ID. Thank you so much again. I thank all the speakers of yesterday and today. Any more thing we got to do by end of four days? Sorry? Any more thing we need?
Okay, so based on this knowledge workshop of yesterday and today, in case you want to do any corrections, additions, you will have four days of time to resubmit your business plan presentation. Anything else? Yeah, I thank uh, our president, uh, Mr. Yes, yeah. Yeah. with the same link. Yes, yeah. with the same link. Yes. Okay, so I thank uh, our president, Mr. Ramesh Chandralahoti, sir, for uh, providing this uh, knowledge workshop for two days. Mr. Keetan Kumar, sir, Chairman, Month in 2024. Dr. C.A.I.S. Prasad, Advisor, Month in 2024, and past president at KCCI, and all the uh, you know, support system that we have got for yesterday and today. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great day. No One second, uh, we have a question. Um, two days sessions hmm. recording video will update in one okay time. so yesterday's and today's video recording will be available on youtube by tomorrow once the editing is done you can definitely take uh, you know the presentations from there and uh, the notes i hope i have answered your question okay thank you so much Yes. Okay, sir. Thank you so much.